Okay, Mr. Chair, we're all set. You can go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Lawton. And uh, we're here and I'm calling, calling the meeting to order of the University of Minnesota Mission Fulfillment Committee for June 11th, 2020. Um, good morning, everyone. I wanna thank those who are joining us by the live stream video. Before I really get started, I'd uh, like to recognize President Gable for some brief remarks. President Gable. Thank you, Chair Anderson, Vice Chair Davenport, members of the committee, uh, good morning, everybody. The academic impacts resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic are significant. And I'd like to start by thanking Provost Croson for hitting the ground running and for her commitment and our university community's commitment to our academic mission in the face of significant challenge. Three months have now passed since we were in Duluth and the decisions we made there and over recent weeks have addressed the immediate challenges of the pandemic, including measures to keep our university community healthy, safe and well, while advancing and curating our academic mission. We have canceled global study abroad programs, including for May and summer, moved to alternate modes of instruction through the end of the spring semester and the summer semester. There is a lot of new work that no one anticipated that has been moving forward in a consultative and information-based decision-making process, and the ongoing work remains functional, intact, and in progression. So throughout this time, Provost Crook and our team have worked to advance us. That work has anchored largely in two ways. The first is through our mission-focused working group that she is co-chairing with Vice President for Research, Chris Kramer. They're asking tough questions related to the uniqueness and value proposition around the academic mission looking ahead in light of the challenges that we're facing. That work is longer term. They will have their first update for you next month and will make subsequent updates as the work progresses. On the more immediate side of things, I charged Provost Croson uh, with leading a working group on fall scenario planning, which you will hear about in a few moments. But before I turn it over to Provost Croson and our presenters, I also want to express my thanks to our students, our faculty and our staff for their flexibility and understanding through this challenging time and for their utmost commitment to the task. We've come a long way very quickly in our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, despite the uncertainty that we all face around the world. And we look forward to ensuring that our academic mission emerges stronger and that our best days lie ahead. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Karen Hansen, who was invaluable to me during my transition and, and before, as you all know, across and throughout my first year. She's been a tremendous source of wisdom and strength to all of us, and I'm grateful for all of her support and guidance and to call her a friend. And I look forward to joining you in formally recognizing her tomorrow. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment to express our university's continued pain and sadness from the tragic death of George Floyd. The past two weeks have been incredibly difficult for our community, locally, across the state, across the country, and around the world. And during my president's report tomorrow, I will go into greater depth on our response um, immediately and looking ahead there as well. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'll proceed. Thank you for those uh, comments, President Gable. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Mission Fulfillment Committee business, but before I do, I want a very quick refresher on our electronic meeting protocol and two notable changes. I will not call on all the regions to comment on every item. Rather, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment on any item in our agenda today, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom or text Maggie Flotten and the staff will keep a speaker's list for me. Please do not jump in without first being recognized. Also, I wanna tell you that Zoom recently changed some of their settings. When I call on you, please unmute yourself. If you forget, board staff will send a prompt via Zoom. We will continue to keep everyone muted to reduce potential background noise and being shown on video when not the active speaker. All votes will be recorded by roll call as required by the open meeting law. Um, for our mission fulfillment meeting today, I wanna, I wanna let you know we have our Board of Regents, but we're also joined by student representatives, Mr. Brandon King of the Morris campus and Ms. Leah Batten of the Twin Cities campus representing professional students. Finally, 
I want to remind everyone that although we can't see our audience, today's meeting is live and open to the public. It's open by the live stream video mode. It will also be archived on our website for later viewing. So with that, let's just turn to our agenda to get started. Our first discussion item, which will be about university rankings and is a discussion item, uh, will not be a vote. Joining us at the committee for this discussion will be Link Carlson, Assistant Vice President of Institutional Analysis, and Peter Radcliffe, Director of Undergraduate Analytics. Um, President Gable, I know that you just spoke. Did you want to provide some more introductory remar remarks on this item, or would you like to turn it over to the presenters? I'm happy to turn it over to the presenters, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, so with that, I will ask Provost Croson to lead us into the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Anderson, members of the board. Rankings are a reality in higher education. And today we wanna to give the board some perspective about what they are and what they mean for the university. To do this, I'm joined by my colleagues, Lincoln Carlson and Peter Ratcliffe. Many of you are acquainted with Mr. Carlson. He's the Assistant Vice President for Institutional Analysis and has worked on a variety of roles for both the Provost's Office and University Budget and Finance for over 25 years. I wanna ask you all to join me in wishing him a very happy birthday today. <laughs> Dr. Radcliffe serves as the Director of Undergraduate Analytics, supporting leadership around enrollment management and student success. He's been at the university for 21 years after earning a PhD in political science. Thank you both for joining me today. Please go to the next slide. As we'll discuss in more detail later in the presentation, rankings measure underlying outcomes about universities that we care about. Graduation rates, student and faculty quality, and faculty student ratios are typical inputs into rankings. These are outcomes that we seek because we believe they are also important. But if that were all that rankings were, we could do better by looking at the underlying data and benchmarking that data against other institutions and working toward improvement. So rankings go beyond simply the data. They also have instrumental value. Rankings provide a lens through which the public views universities. The lens metaphor works well because one sees a university differently depending on which lens or which ranking you use. For example, prospective students may use rankings to determine which universities to apply for and attend. Outside entities like corporations, funding agencies, or international universities may use rankings to help determine who they want to partner with and for what purpose. Employers may use rankings to determine where they send their recruiting staff. And of course, rankings are news. The general public focuses on rankings, especially when they're evaluating the quality of the institutions that their state supports. There are other examples as well. Higher ranked schools may more easily attract high quality faculty and staff. Donors can care about rankings, and sometimes gifts are targeted at improving a unit's rank. In addition uh, to the underlying content that rankings measure, rankings drive individuals to take actions that we want them to take. That said, as we'll see, some rankings are better aligned with our mission, values, and strategic priorities than others. We need to understand what's behind these rankings, and Lincoln and Peter are going to provide a slightly deeper dive into the rankings landscape and our place in it. And with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Uh, very good. Chair Anderson, uh, members of the board, Lincoln Carlson here. Uh, thank you for the birthday wishes. I uh, thought this morning I'm I'm probably somewhere between Regent Kenyanya and Regent Sfigum in terms of my birthday, and I won't tell you which side of that uh, tipping point I might be on. Um, 
I'd just like to say, before I get started, just a couple more words by way of introduction to Dr. Peter Radcliffe, who maybe some of the newer regents uh, haven't had a chance to meet yet. Dr. Radcliffe uh, spends a majority of his time with Vice Provost McMaster and the Office of Undergraduate Education, doing all sorts of undergraduate analytic work on behalf of the campus and the system. But Dr. Radcliffe has always spent part of his appointment with institutional analysis and helping me and the university in a wide range of uh, system-wide issues, including being our institutional expert really on higher education ranking systems. Uh, so that is the signal uh, to you that the provost and I will defer all difficult questions to Peter uh, as we go. Um, let's talk quickly about what rankings really are uh, underneath the hood. Um, and really uh, they are defined by three qualities, uh, organizations, uh, choose which measures they wish to use in evaluating higher education institutions. And these measures can come from public data sources such as iPads. They can come from proprietary uh, data sources such as salary data collected by pay scale. They can be uh, outcome-based like graduation rates or reputational-based surveys administered by the ranking agencies themselves or by third-party sources. Um, and more recently, organizations have again been putting out requests for colleges and, colleges and universities to complete and verify a wide range of new data calculations or administer surveys on behalf of the ranking organizations. Um, so uh, some of the historical ranking organizations have sort of exhausted uh, the publicly available or data or data that they have collected and are looking for new things. Uh, once those ranking organizations have the measures they want, they then uh, generally assign weights to these scores to decide relative importance. So for example, uh, does a ranking system make ACT or SAT entering, score, entering scores worth 10% of their overall score or 40%? If there's a reputational component, does that weigh in at 5% or 50%? So you could have two ranking systems that collect exactly the same sets of data, but have vastly different results due to different weightings. Finally, those measures times whatever weights they put on them add up to an overall score, which is then generally turned into an ordinal ranking system. And so this further obscures the measures and the weights for the reader or the consumer. So as an example, in, in a ranking, system, uh, UW-Madison could be number 10 in, a, in the ranking, the University of Minnesota could be number 11, and Ohio State could be number 12. That tells you nothing about what they measured or how they, met, or how they weighted those measures, but it also tells you nothing about how relatively close or far apart those schools are. The University of Minnesota might be within one-tenth of a one percent of Madison, but well ahead of Ohio State, but you would never know it just from the ranking. So we talk about rankings can be sticky um, because some of the measures, underlying measures are, uh, might change very, very slowly over time. And this is particularly true of reputational surveys, but we've got another interesting example on the next slide. Uh, they can be sensitive in the sense that if there are schools that are closely bunched together in the underlying scores, uh, any year-to-year -year change might uh, influence the ranking, although they're still relatively close together, or ranking systems often change metho methodologies uh, over year-to-year, -year, uh, which has to be understood. And so we often think about uh, thinking about rankings more in terms of tiers. So in, our, in my earlier example, rather than worrying about Madison being in the top, it being number 10 and us being number 11, uh, and Ohio State being number 12, maybe it's better to think about all three of these schools being in the top 20 of this ranking. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, we put example of the, the weightings and the types of measures for uh, one of the more uh, popular rankings, US News and World Report and National Rankings. Um, just to give you a flavor, we won't go through all of these, but I'll just give you, uh, show you some of the challenges here. Uh, for example, uh, in, under student outcomes, which makes up 35% of the U.S. News and World Report score. Um, the U.S. News uses a six-year graduation rate, not a four-year graduation rate. And furthermore, that six-year graduation rate is actually the average 
of the last four six year graduation rates uh, for each school. So if you think about that, these are the results of uh, six year graduation rates for freshman classes that entered in fall 2009, fall 2010, fall 2011, and fall 2012. So that's, those are all classes that entered under President Brunix. We haven't even uh, looked at classes entering under President Kaler or certainly not uh, classes entering last fall or this fall. Um, under student excellence, uh, US News has been struggling as less and less high schools uh, report class standing. Uh, so they have been de-emphasizing that. Uh, and they have used, used the dreaded footnote if a school does not provide uh, standardized test scores for whatever reason, uh, including when schools go uh, test optional and they have been uh, struggling with uh, what to do with that. And finally, expert opinion for the US News and Rule Report comes from a survey administered to university presidents, provosts, and directors of admissions offices. Um, but in the past year, stop, stopped surveying high school counselors. Uh, so a change in methodology there and those expert opinions have uh, been tilting in different ways. So there's always small methodology adjustments, uh, making year over year comparisons even more difficult. Have the next slide, please. Um, and finally, just thinking a little bit about alignment before I let Uh, we've, I've lost him. I don't know if others have. So, um, you know, so for example, uh, research or outreach impacts or commitment to the land grant mission. Um, deciding to, for example, deciding to invest in invasive species research or emphasize rural healthcare initiatives in Minnesota likely did not influence any of the major ranking systems. Uh, though you, and you can think of dozens of others, other examples. Uh, so there's many things that we invest in and want to invest in uh, that will not, uh, very unlikely to move uh, rankings in any significant ways. Um, most ranking systems do not try to measure student experience or student engagement. Uh, that's one of the reasons the Twin Cities campus has been long committed to uh, the SERU, the Student Engagement and Research Universities, and all of our campuses participate in, uh, in something like NESI or other ways to measure uh, student experience and student engagement. Um, and for and they rarely measure employer or employee satisfaction. Uh, so we all, we often try, we do try to track that and are getting better at it, but those types of uh, measures also rarely enter ratings. Uh, to be fair, many of the items on the right-hand side have no national data sets, can be extremely difficult to measure at all, uh, much less in a comparable way across hundreds or thousands of institutions. Um, so rankings can be aligned with what an institution is trying to accomplish uh, or maybe misaligned and ignore important parts of the institution, institution's strategic plan and objectives. Uh, so with that, I'll turn to Dr. Radcliffe to show some of the breadth of rankings that we have before us. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. So thank you. Yeah, we've provided several current rankings as examples. We won't go through these in detail, and they're all described in your docket material. Um, I will note that we're not ignoring our Rochester campus here at all. The fact that the campus is still so relatively new and not easily classified in standard institutional taxonomies um, it means that we're still figuring out how, when, and where to have UMR participate in various rankings. I will note that it's important to look at rankings that are appropriate to the mission and identity of each campus. So we see, for example, rankings related to research output, such as the NSF Heard Survey or the Center for World University rankings listed for the Twin Cities campus and the sustainability focus Sierra Club Cool Schools listed for Morris. Ranking systems will also typically divide the range of institutions into categories that at least partially reflect the different missions and natures of different types of institutions. 
all of our campuses, except for Rochester, appear in U.S. News, for example, but each is on a different list. Because public and private institutions are generally quite different in scope, character, and resources, rankings will often provide separate lists for public institutions as well. And so you can see those rankings listed on all of these. In many college guide type rankings, private schools in general often do better than public schools, reflecting their selectivity, financial resources available per student, and just the different missions and how those missions are valued, intentionally or not, by the many ranking systems. It's also important to recognize that there are over 750 public four-year institutions in the nation, and nearly 1,600 private nonprofit four-year institutions. So anytime you are ranked even relatively highly, you must be doing something right, at least according to the rank criteria of the ranking. But the peer group that you're comparing yourself to is very important. So if we can go to the next slide. So speaking of peers, we wanted to give you a graphic of where the UM Twin Cities campus stands relative to its public Big Ten peers. These rankings are the public school rankings from four different sources, the Center for World University Rankings, the U.S. News Global University Rankings, the U.S. News Domestic now Best Schools Rankings, and then the Washington Monthly College Rankings. And I'll note that the Twin Cities previously ranked higher in the you know, Washington Monthly Rankings until a couple of years ago when Washington Monthly changed its methodology in several areas of its ranking, as Dr. Carlson had referred to earlier. Um, since in rankings, small numbers are positive, we show the rankings of each Big Ten public institution among you know, all public institutions with still the smaller bars representing better rankings. And the University of Minnesota Twin Cities called out in those maroon bars. And you can see across many ranking systems, this is where the university would generally fall in comparison to the Big Ten public institutions, either in the upper third or middle third of the group, um, but also keeping in mind that the Big Ten is an extraordinary collection of schools overall. Can we go to the next slide? Finally, we just wanted to note that there are dozens and dozens of additional specialized rankings that exist in higher education. Some concentrate on specific areas like sustainability metrics or broader metrics of social mobility or internationalization um, and so on. Now, the niche rankings are an interesting one in that they are trying to incorporate an amount of um, crowdsourcing data from students as well as some data around neighborhood affordability and safety. Um, a lot of the methodology is proprietary and maybe kind of dubious, but they are certainly trying to measure something that a number of traditional rankings have not. There's also a set of undergraduate and graduate program specific rankings. Um, and most of them have the same caveats as campus rankings, but because the ends are smaller, they are more sensitive to year-to-year -year fluctuations. We do also want to acknowledge the importance of rankings for professional schools, even though they too have the same caveats that we've been talking about. Again, it's important to understand what these rankings are actually measuring to assure that their criteria aligns with our overall university strategic plans. However, both incoming students and employers do very much care about these rankings. So even if I might think that the public overvalues them a bit. Um, with that, I will hand them back to Assistant Vice President, President Coulson to talk about our institutional efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and before I just hand it back to the provost for discussion, um, there was a there was a question from a regent as we were preparing this about the cost of participating in rankings um, or the benefit cost trade off. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that, you know, almost all of these data are collected and assembled by administrative staff within the university and within each campus and sometimes within each college. Uh, we are always trying to point folks uh, and new ranking systems at data we already have collected for other reasons. It could be iPads, it could be the common data set or things we already collect for accreditation. Uh, but as rankings, as the rankings world has become more competitive and creative, uh, new rankings and requests do abound, and we can talk about that in discussion if you're interested. But I do want to assure the board that institutional analysis and bean counters like me do not personally decide which rankings to participate in. Uh, we bring those decisions to provosts and chancellors and vice presidents as necessary, and we discuss the benefit of participation versus the number of additional administrative hours 
needed to assemble the data, communicate the data, and maintain the data. But academic leaders always make the choices uh, here. Uh, and we can talk about how we evaluate those if you wish. But with that, I will turn it back to Provost Croson uh, for any discussion questions. Next slide, please. Thank you uh, again, Chair Anderson, members of the board and Lincoln and Peter. We welcome your discussion and we're happy to address your questions. Uh, here we're offering three potential considerations to think about, but of course we're happy to follow your lead on discussion. The three questions that we wanted to raise were, how much should we focus on rankings or a particular ranking, especially when they do or don't align well with the system strategic plan? Uh, how should the board consider university rankings as a whole, which has been the focus of most of our discussion, as opposed to disciplinary or professional school rankings? Uh, and the third point is, given that there are no rankings for university systems as a whole, how should we or the board consider rankings that focus on individual campuses? That is, how much variation uh, should we be comfortable with across the campuses in terms of which rankings each one prioritizes? Uh, so with that, that concludes our remarks, and we look forward to your discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Regent uh, Provost Colson, Assistant Vice President Colson, and Dr. Radcliffe. Um, good presentation. Regents, I'm now going to turn it to discussion. If you have a question or comment, please use the raise hand feature or alert a uh, Board of Regents staff member that you'd like to visit. The last time I looked on the raise hands, oh, I do see one now. Uh, Regent McMillan, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Confirm that I'm unmuted. I think I am. We can hear you. Okay. Can you? Um, so this may be too sweeping of a question to lend itself to a a quick answer, but I, I'm sure it's on the minds of most, if not all of my colleagues. As we look at ourselves, where one of our five campuses has gone test optional and we see headlines like the University of California, one of the biggest public educational institutions in the world, um, moving away from standardized tests, but I know they're gonna build their own. Um, our neighbor to the east in Wisconsin and you know so on down the line. How do you, in our leadership team feel about that and and more what does it mean to rankings I, I we've all got our opinions about test optional i'm not asking for those thoughts what i'm asking is do these do these rankings mean as much when you get rid of a act test that tends to end up in a fall off in uh, high school rankings which were the only two probably are the two most objective measures of it. What, what good are rankings? Let me summarize it that way. If you start to have systems the size of California dropping out of it. Mm -hmm. Chair Vice Anderson, uh, yeah. ahead, Chair Anderson Regent McMillan, thank you for the question. So uh, indeed, I'm going to, I'm going to push a little bit to our next presentation to uh, Vice Provost McMaster to talk about the substantive question about test optionality. Um, but as you, as you correctly surmise, uh, not having uh, test scores to report, just like not having uh, high school rank or GPA to report, does indeed influence where one is ranked. Um, exactly how different ranking agencies handle that is, again, a little different. Uh, so for some, they only report, they, they don't report at all. For others, they include the test scores of the students who did report the test. And so it becomes a very selected sample of students that are in the average test score report for the rankings agency. Um, and and uh, Lincoln Peter might even know some other models there, but they, you know, whatever decision is made on that basis will indeed influence our rankings in some direction or another. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Radcliffe, Vice uh, President Colson, anything to add to that, or you're okay? No, no, no. no Chair, have I Henry, had? No, go ahead, and, uh, uh, Dr. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will say, no, um, as you imagine, ranking agencies are um, reacting to these changes, and so they're changing their methodologies um, in response. Um, 
Provost Croson alluded to some of those. Um, there's also cases, the U.S. News, for example, below a certain threshold will apply a penalty to the score on the test score item um, in order to sort of balance what they think is the you know, sort of upward trend that you get from fewer students reporting test scores. Um, and we've seen the weighting that's been given to test scores being reduced on a couple of rankings. So there are ways that the you know, rankings groups are reacting to that, and I'm sure we'll see more of that if this becomes more pervasive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent McMillan, does that answer your questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be going to Regent Shu next, and I also see Regent Rosha, you're on deck, and Regent Powell in the hole. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, very interesting topic. Um, and as, you know, as noted by Regent McMillan, who brought up my test optional conversation before I did, which I appreciate. Um, I think it is, uh, we're living in extraordinary times, as we all know, and um, students right now are not even able to take these tests. Um, the June tests have all been canceled. And right now, um, if you want to take the test in July in Minnesota, you got to go like way up north or over to Wisconsin because all the all the test slots are currently full. And then when they cancel those, which they will likely do, uh, then it's just going to create a bigger problem in terms of uh, people getting access to um, actually take the tests. So it's a, it's, it's a struggle, obviously, for the testing companies, um, schools like um, the University of California, who um, have decided not to um, require the tests or not to even accept the tests, um, I think uh, is the trend that uh, is, is going to set the standard going forward. Um, I think we could have been leaders, but now we're followers. And I think uh, we should be um, uh, at least making a decision fairly quickly on uh, what's going to happen in the next year or so in terms of the testing, because uh, the scores will not be available. Now, let me just remind people that test optional just means that we're going to process your application, even if you don't have a test. In the past, we would say your, your application is incomplete. We're not going to process your application, even though we accept a large number of people with um, relatively low test scores uh, compared to you know, others that uh, we might uh, favor. So uh, I think that there's an opportunity for us um, to quickly make an announcement on that. But you know, now that we're talking about rankings, uh, let me shift over. We have invested a lot of money in rankings for the law school. Um, in the prior administration, um, we decided uh, several years ago that we wanted to increase the allocation for the law school by $10 million a year. That has, uh, as you can see from the presentation, uh, we've now slipped below the top 20. We're now 21. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know if uh, that that was a good use of or is a good use of money because it's $10 million um, each year ongoing. So um, there's an issue there. I think that maybe answers a little bit of the discussion questions that we were given. Um, and also, I noticed that uh, our pharmacy ranking went from two to three. I'm not quite sure what happened with that, but, you know, I, I hope someone's looking into that. I, I really do think the... Um, the point was made that uh, the rankings are important. Yeah, sure, rankings are important, um, but they also need to be fair. And um, right now, the the biggest game in town is is U.S. News, and I think um, because of the the testing situation and that, I think it was listed as thirty five percent in terms of uh, student quality. I think that's going to be a challenge for them to continue using that. So they're going to, as, as was pointed out, they're going to be shifting um, how they're actually going to uh, calculate these in the future. Um, regarding the, uh, so one question I have regarding the, uh, 
the colleges and departments. I'm not sure how those, I mean, I think the discussion above was more about how the institution was ranked, but not how parts of the institution is ranked. I have looked um, into the law school uh, ranking system and I actually tried to re-engineer re-engineer it, but I actually ran into a problem where I couldn't actually figure out why the schools that were highly ranked in uh, the law schools, uh, law school rankings were actually ranked higher than other, other ones um, without uh, looking into some of the specific uh, data points that they had. So I'm wondering, if, A, if we um, are re-engineering some of these, it sounds like we are, but I've never seen any information on it. Um, I'd like to see information on it. Um, what are we re-engineering? What specific areas are causing us to drop in certain rankings, like the law school? And with the law school rankings specifically, there are a lot of reputational type things, like you know they survey federal judges and they survey uh, other lawyers and things like that. And of course, you know the the traditionally um, large schools, uh, you know, like Harvard actually is fairly large in terms of its number of uh, graduates per year, number of uh, people starting there. Uh, so they actually, there are actually a lot of Harvard graduates out there. <laughs> of course, you know, assuming most of them are pretty good, they're going to be ranked higher than uh, smaller schools. So I, I don't think they're, I don't think that uh, part of it is actually fair, but I would like to hear from, um, I guess, uh, Peter, uh, how we're actually tracking those types of things and if we've actually tried to do some re-engineering ourselves. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Regent Shu. Uh, just, just so you all know, we'll go to uh, Dr. Radcliffe here in a moment, but just so you know, I've got Regent Rosha, Regent Powell, Regent Kenyana, Regent Mayron, and Regent Beeson, and we will cut it off at that time. Uh, this is a discussion item and not a voting item today, so we're going to cut it at 1030. So please try to give your... Uh, other regents time. So Dr. Radcliffe or Provost Croson, if you have an answer to Regent Shu's question. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Shu. Uh, my, as we mentioned before, the purpose of this presentation was really to talk about university-wide rankings rather than particular uh, individual colleges or schools, but I'd be happy to get back with you on the uh, backwards uh, the, uh, analysis that we've done about law school rankings in particular. Dr. Radcliffe, anything to add to that? Nope, that yeah, covers it. Thank you very much, uh, Chair right, Anderson. Thank, thanks for the question, Regent Shu. Regent Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do you, are you able to still hear me? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Um, just th this is a really uh, important topic. It, it's kind of a sleeper topic because much of what we will end up doing over time is, is guided by our perception of the importance of rankings. And, and I really appreciated the way this presentation was made and, and uh, both Mr. Ratcliffe and, and uh, Provost Prozen, um, I think there was a sensitivity to the fact that they are important, but um, there are some considerations well beyond uh, the, the objective rankings that are out there. Um, by way of another painful vignette from yesteryear when I was a candidate for this board in 1988, and you can do the math on how long ago that was, I was uh, pinned by a um, a legislator who had been in, in at the legislature for uh, 30 plus years, which means this is a person who'd been considering the university's role and standing in the state since uh, you know, less than 100 years after the, the uh, statehood and, and you know, more than that ago from now, um, uh, you know, asked the question, you know, what, what is the role of our land grant university? Is it to be an elite, highly ranked institution or is it to be one that serves the state and, and hence the world as best it possibly can. Um, and uh, you know, at that point I was a bit floored by the question and I'm sure I gave a, an, a, an unimpressive answer, but it, it, has been a, it has been an analysis that I've been doing for all of this time, uh, both during times when I've served on this board and in the interim. Um, and you know, one, of the, one of the real challenges we have is, as, as has been noted by uh, people far more educated on this than me is, is you know, there's, there are some pretty strong biases. There's some coastal biases you know, in many of the rankings, when it, it really depends on what you're measuring. You start to plug in starting salary, and obviously you throw in kids in the Manhattan, you're going to be doing a lot better than if people are going back to rural communities in the Midwest. And so we, I think we just have to be very mindful. I've also been somewhat uh, bemused by the fact that, um, that you know, we've, we've done so much better in, in kind of targeting, 
you know, a student body that has a higher profile in terms of ACT scores and, and academic standing. But yet when I came back after a hiatus, I noticed that the schools that were ranked highly back when we had a lower graduation rate and, and served as a more of a commuter sort of uh, almost community college campus for the, the, the metro area, those same programs were ranked highly and others were not. There was a big a big debate about, um, we made we made substantial investments into the Carlson School with the intent of making it a top five uh, business school. And you know, lo and behold, when I came back, we were positioned almost identically to where we had been before we made those investments. Now, by no means, in my view, does that diminish the value and quality of our business school. It's one of the best in the world. Uh, it's just that the, based on the various benchmarks that some people use to determine rankings, we are situated in the Midwest and we have a different model for me, the, the primary consideration as to whether we rank highly, and you know, I use air quotes around rank, is does this business community uh, it, it believe it's served well by the product, by the, by the people coming out of our business school? And when you consider the number of Fortune 500 headquarters, and when you, you know, consider the demand for our graduates, I, I would put our business school up against any in the country. Uh, it just becomes somewhat of a, of a, of a battle over what, which variables you select. And so we're all very mindful of it. Um, I, I do recall there was a, uh, a, a study, if you will call it that, on, on law schools. This is many years ago, where somebody put out some dummy variables uh, in terms of academic rank and so on. And they had, in, uh, there was a, an institution that did not have a law school inserted, but the institution itself was well regarded. And so it, it, its law school ranked highly, even though they didn't have one. And so it just goes to show there are some real challenges with getting accurate rankings. And, and so, um, yes, let's be mindful of it, but let's not lose our mission. Um, this institution has a very special role in this in this state and, and, and in the nation and world, and we should continue to focus on the the important things. My my basic perception is it's it's, it's whether it's you know um, whether it's you know putting it down to one of these sort of overwrought and overused analogies in you know sports. Um, you know, if your goal is to be the best batter uh, in, in the major leagues. Focus on your hitting, <laughs> you know, as opposed to focusing on where you are in the rankings. And, and, and if you do what you're supposed to do and you do it exceptionally well, the rankings should follow and certainly the rankings that are most important to what you're trying to do. So I really appreciate the presentation and, and uh, um, you know, th this is important stuff and I look forward to the next conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, just so you know, Regent Powell, you're going to be on deck when I announced them. I had Regent Simonson down and I skipped his name when I, I read them. So Regent Simonson. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, presenters. I, I too really appreciated it. As I look at the uh, <coughs> rankings, especially for things like academic uh, reputation, publications, graduation rates, I'm very supportive of that. It has already been said that rankings do cost a lot of money, and especially if you want to raise in rankings I think in your presentation. It does cost a lot of money, but we saw about a week ago a ranking come out on patents in the, in the university, and I do have some questions about that because patents do cost a lot of money, as everybody knows, and, and so I think we need more information uh, as far as contribution to our land grant mission to the U, to the state, to the nation, the world. What are we just getting a patent? Uh, I suppose it would benefit a faculty member. Uh, also, and but have a ranking on um, patents without more information. You know, how many of them got licensed out? What do they do? What to do for the uh, resources coming into the university? That kind of thing. Just to say we're ranked here doesn't mean a lot to me on some things like patents. That's just my comment. All right. Thank you, Regent Simonson. I see no question there. So we'll move on to uh, Regent Powell. You're on mute, Ken. Regent Paul, you're on mute. Yeah, once again. There you go. One, you, one, one day I will I will get good at this, but not today apparently. So I just want to um, to chime in and and say, look, I appreciate the presentation and that you know there is nuance here, but I, I come down on the side that you know these um, they are they are important, you know, flaws and all. Uh, the rankings and the reason to me for me is that they they're an opportunity for an outside third party uh, perspective on the institution and 
I think it's very important for us to get that sort of uh, critique, um, you know, recognizing that there are flaws. Uh, it is, you know, we are in a very competitive industry. And, you know, maybe even more important than the, you know, sort of the number of our rank, uh, these rankings can awful signal, often signal trends uh, and, the, and, and trends that if they go on for a long period of time, trends that we might not like uh, and, and need to know about and that would, you know, sort of uh, maybe signal that, you know, we have some issues and problems in some of our important schools. So I, I think having an outside third party uh, perspective is, is really, really important for us. Uh, as a way to guard against complacency. I mean, you know, totally absent rankings, you know, the danger is that we, you know, sit in, you know, our boardroom or in your conference rooms and, and talk about how great we are, uh, you know, without really having any external data. So I think they're very, very important. Uh, and I take your point, uh, Provost Hansen, uh, Pro Provost Croson, that, you know, we need to be strategic about uh, which rankings uh, we choose, uh, a, a strategic alignment, mission alignment, uh, but we could all probably come up with um, a list of, um, you know, of schools and departments and things that we that we would want to have looked at, um, you know, in a competitive context, in a ranking context. I guess my request and suggestion is that, you know, given, you know, this environment that we're in and that there are, you know, pluses and minuses to rankings, I think it'd be really helpful for, for uh, uh, Provost Hansen, your team to, Provost, Provost Croson, I beg your pardon, your team to give us a few straw men or options for rankings that you, you, would th you, you think would be very helpful to the cause, uh, that would be strategic, it's something that we can react to, because I, I think it'd be difficult for, as, as a board for us to come up with a list, but I think we can react to suggestions and maybe build on it you know, given that it sounds like the direction of the discussion is that we, you know, flaws and all, you know, we think our rankings are, are useful, uh, you know, when applied in a strategic and selective way, but we're going to need your help maybe on helping us pick what those would be. That's my, that's my comment, uh, Chair Anderson. Okay, thank you, Regent Paul. Uh, Provost Croson, he, he gave you possibly a little work there. Would you like to comment at all and, and let us know if that's something you can do for us? Absolutely. We're happy to, to provide some suggestions about rankings that we think uh, should be focused on and why. Thank you for the suggestion. Terrific. Thank you. We're going to move on to uh, Regent Kenyanya. And again, we've got Regent Kenyanya, Regent Mayron, and Regent Beeson, and then we'll be finished with this uh, segment of the agenda. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, as well as the presenters for the important topic. I had about three questions, but uh, most of them have really been covered. Um, so I, I won't ask those. I, I guess I'll just make a short comment. I agree with a lot of what's been said. You know, rankings are important if, if for no other reason, uh, but because others have decided they're important. You know, we, um, you know, prospective students are looking at them and, and research funding and all that stuff. So even if we don't think, you know, I'm skeptical on them myself, but, um, because others have decided they're important, we can't ignore them. I will say, um, I, I do think, and agree with what others have said, including uh, or region Rosha that rankings can or chasing rankings can come at the expense of mission um, and particularly in admissions and enrollment. Um, I, and I would just caution um, us against that, obviously. And, and I guess I'd wonder, um, I guess maybe there is a question here, how, I mean, what controls, what, what, how do we, how do we look at that and make sure that, um, uh, that when we're pursuing rankings, it's not coming at the expense of mission, um, you know, in, in, a, in an attempt to be elite or, or whatever. Um, how, how, do we, how does administration approach that? I guess that uh, Provost Croson, I guess you probably are the one who maybe can answer that. Sure. So I think um, I, I'm, I'm still sufficiently new to the institution that I'm not sure I can answer this with full certainty. I think it's been about 12 weeks at this point. So, um, but from what I've seen so far, and certainly my experience at other institutions, is that we don't alter our admissions decisions or criteria based on rankings, right? Um, we do think about our policies around admission based on rankings, but for you're an individual student, we don't necessarily say you're in and you're out because of that. Um, on the other hand, you know, when the board sets an ACT target, Right, we're setting it with full knowledge, with the 
about its implications on the rankings that are likely to result. So that's, I'm not sure that's a, that's a clear enough answer. And I'm certainly happy to continue the discussion if, uh, if you'd like. But I think in general, what I've seen here certainly is uh, everybody's doing what we feel we need to do in order to advance the institution. And the rankings are something that follows rather than something that drives. Thank you. Does that answer the question, Regent Kenyano? Uh, it does. Thank you, Provost Croson. Thank you, Regent, for asking the question. We'll move on to Re Regent uh, Mayron. And make sure you unmute, please. I was all set to do that and didn't. Thank you, Chair <laughs> Anderson. Uh, I was looking at the three questions that you all put to us in our materials, both uh, in the written materials and on the slides, and at least wanted to give you uh, my sense of, uh, or response to them to the extent that will be helpful to you. Um, with respect to the first question on the uh, um, weight that should be given uh, in terms of what we should place on rankings, alignment with our strategic priorities, et cetera. I think I, I agree with what others have said here. Um, we can't ignore rankings. They're out there. People rely on them, but they should not be the tail that wags the dog. Um, at the end of the day, we need to derive what our strategic plan is, what, uh, consistent with our mission. That needs to be our first priority. And hopefully, uh, to the extent they impact rankings, it will be in a positive way. But I don't think ranking should be the driver, but rather the strategic plan. In terms of question two about how much uh, should we as an institution focus on disciplinary or professional rankings versus university-wide rankings, you know, I think that's a, uh, evolving in that I think now in this environment today, I think that the professional rankings are going to be carrying more weight on a going forward basis because of the emphasis on incoming classes on where, what am I, how am I going to use my degree to get a job? Um, when I went to the university a million years ago and went to CLA, that wasn't what was on our mind. Uh, and we looked at the university uh, as a whole in terms of, is this an institution I want to go to? Now I think students approach it differently. And so I think we need to be aware of that. And I think our focus needs to probably be more on the professional rankings than on the university wide ranking. Not that you ignore it, but I do think that tends to be more of a driver uh, of, you know, whether it's our dentistry program or our uh, nursing program or our um, engineering program or uh, business. I think that's what dri is driving decisions at this, at this time. That may change in the future. And um, I do, you know, it looks like system rankings are not something that uh, all those organizations who are doing rankings are interested in. So I think trying to invest in that um, is not a good use of our money and we need to continue to focus on what they are interested in is, which is a university by university campus and then within them, what it is that they can offer career-wise in a professional setting for their students, whether it's undergrad or grad. Those are my comments. Thank you. And I, I didn't really hear a question there, but they're great comments. So that's terrific. Um, I've got Regent Beeson to speak. And then uh, Regent Sviggum wanted to wrap us up on this. So we've got about five minutes. And let's, let's go ahead, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good conversation. You know, I on the mission versus the rankings, I would contend that most of the, um, that they're, they are in alignment. In other words, there's nothing better to deliver our mission than having great students as measured by those who are most prepared through an ACT score or the quality of the faculty or the amount of research. So I think all those things flow into our mission at the end of the day. Um, we have this, I, the, the questions that the provost has raised about these are really good things to ponder. We have sort of a love-hate relationship with rankings. We use them. I think Regent Shu made this comment a year or so ago that sort of stuck with me. We use rankings when it's convenient for us. And I'm reminding people, we, for many years, we had this, the, re, the medical school ranking, but paid no attention to it. It was never brought to us. Now we're measuring it. Now we've, we're asking the president to 
to uh, act on it and to improve that. So I think, you know, I am a measurement um, quantitative person. I believe that it drives behaviors. I think you have to have numbers behind it. The quality of the ranking, the, sort of the criteria is inconsistent. I hope that we're weighing in with the with the U.S. News and World Reports or whoever's making these in terms of criteria. And I don't know if that's just at the institutional level or the Big Ten or the AEU, but I hope we're influencing those as much uh, as much as we can. Uh, finally, I hope the president, using the medical school as an example, and the provost and the regional Powell talked about this. We need to use this in in terms of the deans or a chair of the department's uh, work program, we, where we think that is strategic and attainable, we should be putting rankings in their work plans and coming back to the board with identifying five or so sort of really important rankings where we think that they mean something, where they're part of the mission is a good place to start. And I think that'll help train the board so it's something we already have medical school, but it's beyond that. We have law school, but it's beyond that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Regent Beeson. Those are those are actually great comments about getting that into the work plan and improving the rankings and all those schools. Finally, we'll wrap up here with Regent Stigum. Brief comment. Please unmute. Mr. Chairman? Thank you, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with the comments of uh, Regent Beeson and Regent Powell, I will pass. Thank you very much, Regent Sveigum. So I'm just going to thank that'll bring us to an end of uh, that first agenda item on university rankings and discussion. I want to thank uh, Link Carlson, Peter Radcliffe, and of course, Provost Croson for their uh, remarks. So thank you. We are, you know, we've got three items on the agenda today that are all really, really interesting. And I I apologize for hurrying you up during these discussion items when they're not voting, but uh, we do have another meeting after lunch. Um, but our second item today is going to be on the system undergraduate enrollment update. That is also a discussion item, not an action item, something that we're all very, very interested in. We always look forward to it every time these people are here. And it's an update uh, that will be presented by Vice Provost McMaster. Vice Chancellor Jeffrey Ratliff Crane from our Rochester campus, and Interim Vice Chancellor Melissa Burt from our Morris campus. Um, I'm just gonna ask Provost Croson, would you like to begin with opening comments? Thank you, Chair Anderson, members of the board. I understand that this next item about system undergraduate enrollment management has become a regular presentation at your June meeting. This initiative is a particularly important one as we consider how to increase the systemness of the university. Today, I'm delighted to welcome three representatives from our System Enrollment Council. The council has been convening for several years now to share practices, study the enrollment process, and identify paths for cooperation and shared success. Our presenters are Melissa Burt, Robert McMaster, and Jeff, Jeffrey Radcliffe Crane. Dr. Burt is Interim Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management at the Morris Campus and has been in that role since July, 2019. She simultaneously serves as the Senior Director of Institutional Effectiveness at Morris and has held that position since fall, 2015. You already know Dr. McMaster. He has served as a Professor of Geography uh, at the Twin Cities campus since 1989 and as chair from 2005 to 2008. He served as vice provost and dean of undergraduate education since 2008. Dr. Radcliffe Crane is vice chancellor for academic affairs and innovation at the Rochester campus and has been in that role since fall 2018. Previously, he was professor of psychology at the Morris campus from 1989 to 2013 and he's a member of the Academy of Distinguished Teachers. I want to thank them for presenting today, as well as the other members of the System Enrollment Council for their work. I understand that Vice Provost and Dean McMaster will get us started. Vice Provost McMaster, whenever you're ready, and, and a reminder to unmute your microphone. I believe I'm unmuted. 
And I wonder if we could go to the first slide. Chair Anderson and members of the committee, today we'd like to review the activities of the System Enrollment Council. The System Enrollment Council was created in 2017 to facilitate cooperation among the five campuses around enrollment and admissions issues and overall student success issues. We've undergone change in thinking over the past few years uh, with this council, uh, where campuses share information and ideas and where there's a new spirit of cooperation and competition. Uh, there still is and should be competition. However, healthy competition is good for high functioning organizations. Each of the campuses, of course, has their own, <clears throat> their own enrollment plans and goals. And you've heard uh, about these in the past and each has their own particular initiatives. We wanna make it clear that the system council takes a broad view of enrollment management. And this includes admissions, financial aid, first year programs, uh, retention and graduation, basically all components of student success. Uh, some of the goals of the council are listed here on this slide. We'll, we'll get into further details in the presentation. And it should also be noted that the work of this council fits very, very well with commitment one of President Gable's strategic plan, and that's around student success. Next slide. Each year we try to provide an update on the system enrollment environment that our campuses face. These are points that we have made before, including the challenge of decreasing numbers of high school graduates, the rapidly changing geodemographics of the state and the region, and the intense competition for students. The state of Minnesota continues to be a net exporter of high school students. Next slide. Here, we provide data on the projections of Minnesota high school graduates over the next decade or so. Unfortunately, we have not yet received the newest high school graduate numbers from the state, which we use in, in these projections. Uh, so this is the same graph of the of projections we used last year. We hope to get those new numbers in the not too distant future. As you can see from the graph, the state is currently on an upward trend where we have a projected peak of high school graduates around 2025 to 26. Uh, where we reach approximately 67,000 graduates, after which time the graduates drop precipitously. This really is part of a national enrollment picture as reported commonly in the literature. In fact, the Chronicle of Higher Education just published a monograph entitled The Looming Enrollment Crisis that documents the many challenges universities will face over the coming decade around enrollment issues. The trend is even worse in the upper middle west, albeit Minnesota is in better shape than many, uh, and the eastern United States. Next slide. The out-migration of Minnesota high school graduates and in-migration is depicted on this map of the upper middle west. Maroon arrows show the out-migration out of Minnesota uh, high school graduates, while the yellow arrows show the in-migration. For instance, in fall 2000, in the period fall 2018, or that, that, that uh, enrollment class, 2,245 Minnesota high school graduates attended college in North Dakota, while 464 North Dakota students crossed the, the border into Minnesota. The same balance can be, can be detected, imbalance for all the states, except Illinois and Indiana. Indiana has very small numbers here. Where more Illinois students attended college in Minnesota than the other direction. Overall, the imbalance just for these states is two to one. That is, we lose two students out of the state for every one we bring in. This represents a significant challenge um, for us. The Twin Cities is also filled with recruiters from other states since our K-12 system produces excellent students. One other trend 
uh, to mention is a rapid increase in the diversity of Minnesota high school graduates. And we provided data in the past around um, that particular uh, distribution. Next slide. This slide illustrates that for each of the campuses, there's a different set of competitors for the freshman class. So for the period 2015 to 2019, the University of Minnesota Crookston, for the University of Minnesota Crookston, 17.6% of the students who were accepted, accepted at Crookston, but did not enroll there, went to the Twin Cities campus. 7.3% went to UMD, and 3.4% uh, went to North Dakota State. The top three competitors for UMD Duluth were the Twin Cities campus, St. Thomas and UW Eau Claire. For the Twin Cities campus, the top three competitors were UW Madison, not surprisingly, University of Illinois and St. Thomas. Other institutions that show up in this list include uh, Minnesota State Mankato and UW La Crosse. Perhaps not surprisingly, St. Thomas appears as a competitor for all five of the campuses. So each year we rerun these data to look carefully at what is the competitor set for our institutions. Uh, I'd like to now deter, turn the presentation over to Vice Chancellor Melissa Burt to continue with some of these ideas. Next slide, Vice please. Vice Chancellor Burt, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Chair Anderson and, and members of the board. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you about the accomplishments of the System Enrollment Council since the last update, and also to speak briefly about future direction. Although I will touch briefly on some of what has been achieved, I encourage you to review the docket materials for more detailed information. We have grouped the system-wide work into three areas as listed here. Next slide, please. The first area of emphasis is brand messaging and communications. As a reminder, the Enrollment Communications Work Group was created in spring 2019 and brings together enrollment and communications professionals from all five campuses. This group's primary, primary objective is to develop communications to increase inquiries and applications of qualified undergraduate applicants across the entire University of Minnesota system. The Enrollment Communications Group recently completed working with an outside firm to conduct a market research study. Survey participants were prospective students and the parents and guardians of prospective students from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the Dakotas. Key takeaways and specific recommendations will be discussed with the System-Wide Enrollment Council this summer, and some of the areas of opportunity are listed on this slide. The research suggests that the University of Minnesota brand could be strengthened through increased awareness of the five UMN campuses. One way that this can be achieved is by expanding messaging that highlights the distinct features of each campus. As we know, University of Minnesota campuses are affordable options for Minnesota students. The research indicates a lack of awareness about the university's affordability compared to regional competitors. Research participants also indicated an interest in being able to access information about all campuses in one location and apply to multiple campuses at once. The system could better highlight current application tools and cross system information for potential students, parents, and guardians. Work has also continued to expand offerings on the system.umn.edu website, which launched a little under a year ago. The priority has been to expand resources for prospective students and their families as they search for a campus that meets their unique interests, needs, and academic goals. To that end, a one-page campus information grid has been created that provides a quick snapshot of each campus and is housed on the system site. The handout will also be used at future recruitment events. Also, a new cross-campus academic program search allows prospective students to search for whatever program they are interested in and be directed to every University of Minnesota campus that offers that area of study. Next slide, please. The next area of emphasis is coordinated recruitment and cooperation. There are many examples of system-wide partnerships and events, some of which were discussed at length in last year's presentation. I will highlight just a few of them here. 
The admissions directors group, composed of enrollment leaders from all five campuses, regularly meets to share best practices and information, as well as plan system-wide recruitment events. System partners also continue to collaborate in the development of K through 12 pathways and campus partnership agreements. For example, food, World Food Prize events at several UMN campuses provide high school students the opportunity to engage with local leaders and experts on critical global challenges. In terms of recruitment, admission staff regularly work together to recruit students to the University of Minnesota system. Two examples are the fall high school counselor meetings and student recruitment events. This past year, as occurs every fall, members of the system directors group traveled to two areas of the state in order to meet with high school counselors as well as prospective students and families. It was a great opportunity for me as a native Californian to experience parts of the state that I had yet to reach. Uh, participants are able to engage with representatives from all UMN campuses in these events. Additionally, they learn both about the commonalities across the system campuses, for example, access to endless academic resources and exceptional faculty, and also their distinctive differences. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it back over to Bob. The slide that you're looking at here shows the current status of the Share My App initiative that we talk about each year. As a reminder, Share My App allows students who apply to the Twin Cities campus to also be considered at the other campuses. They simply check a box on the digital application and the application is shared with whatever campuses they choose. For fall 2020, there were several major changes to Share My App that both made it easier to share uh, by that simple checking of a box and more information was provided on the system campuses, details on the programs and, and excellence of those institutions. Based on these changes, one can see the significant increase in applications shared between fall 2019 and 20. Since the program is in transition, not all the campuses witness an increase in confirms. I think we'll see that as, as it progresses. Uh, Duluth did see an increase from 79 to 118 confirms, and UMR saw an increase from 16 to 41 confirms. Uh, the UMTC also shared thousands of names from the wait list with the system campuses. Next slide. Another area of cooperation is around financial support and financial packaging for our students. Several of these initiatives include the University Promise Program, the brand new 2020 scholarship program just started in May uh, for students just above the U of M Promise uh, financial threshold and the Benson Scholarship. This scholarship, Benson, secured $15 million from the Benson Foundation as a match to support Pell eligible students, a program known as the Benson Challenge. Next slide. The University of Minnesota Promise Program, originally created as the Founders Free Tuition Program, allocates nearly $30 million to support low and middle income students across the system. In total, over 14,000 undergraduates are supported by Promise funds with an average award of about $2,000 and a maximum of over 4,000. And I like to point out that for students who are zero EFC, zero expected family contribution, um, the, the lowest income students, they will receive $6,000 in Pell, uh, about $6,000 in uh, uh, state grant, Minnesota state grant, and another $4,000 in, in uh, Promise. Uh, thus around 16,000 or so in support uh, in gift aid. Additionally, the Twin Cities shared over 5,000 names from the UMTC wait list. Some of these names were then considered on multiple campuses. Next slide. Finally, we're pleased that the U of M campuses all fall at the low end of the average Minnesota net price distribution depicted here. The net price is calculated as the cost of attendance in, our, in the Twin Cities case around 29,000, minus all forms of gift aid, including federal, state, and institutional sources. As would be expected, the public universities have the lowest net prices 
with the privates having higher levels. The lowest net price is U of M Morris with a net price of $8,000. In part, this is a result of the tuition waivers provided for our American Indian students by federal and state mandates and statutes at Morris. All of the U of M campuses fall within the lowest 10 institutions in the state in terms of average net price. Uh, Vice Chancellor Radcliffe, Radcliffe Crane will now discuss our current enrollment and student success metrics. Gary um, Anderson, members of the board, uh, good morning. Uh, there are three elements of enrollment planning shared in the following slides. One, new student recruitment. Two, persistence and retention. And third, success and graduation. For each of the campuses of the University of Minnesota, there are different missions with different strengths, points of pride, and challenges. As we've seen in some of the variation in enrollment and competition patterns, this is partially a game of finding the best fit and working with students once here to not only survive, but to thrive. Next slide, please. This slide has been updated from data provided in your docket to reflect the, the most up-to-date information. Important to note that there are, is a lot of nuance uh, for each circumstance with more campus context, again, provided in the docket. As the system enrollment uh, discussion it's equally important to note the overall success of the university to be at this point with one, within 1.5% 1 of last year's new freshman enrollment, despite the uncertainty and turmoil at the very point students would normally be finalizing their decisions. Transfer students uh, are down about 4% compared to last year, but we expect later decisions by those students because of the ongoing uncertainty for the upcoming year. In each, the diversity and academic strength has been maintained. And uh, I do want to take a, a short pause and provide kudos and appreciation to our admissions teams on each of the campuses for succeeding at this extremely challenging work. Uh, can't say enough about their hard work, dedication, ability to pivot in the midst of the pandemic. Our work isn't done here uh, with campuses continuing to accept deposits and continuing to try and close the deal on a number of students. We're all also working to maintain the relationships through engaging uh, online advising and registration programs, building community, albeit remotely, uh, before the fall. Next slide, please. We tend to focus a lot on recruitment of new students, but retaining students is necessary for maintaining healthy enrollment. As reflected here, each campus operates under different contexts and situations, and this suggests different rates of retention for retention and graduation that are appropriate for each. This not only reinforces the, import the importance of fit, bringing students who have potential to thrive onto each campus, but the important work that happens when students are on campus, from academic early alert to targeted financial support, student life programming, climate for diverse students, and more. Retention and moving students to timely graduation uh, are campus-wide goals and endeavors. While each campus is analyzing and building responses to increase retention and persistence, the System Enrollment Council is engaged in how students may persist within the system. That is, rather than transferring from a university campus to another non-university school, what are the barriers to moving within the university? How can we optimize multi-I enrollment? This is all work that the council has started discussing. Next slide, please. Given the points shown in previous slides about retention being key to healthy enrollment, we are mindful of the effect COVID-19 may be having on student, decision, student decisions to return to our campuses in fall 2020. We don't know for certain until students actually show up in the fall, uh, but course registration and course from returning students are near what we expect to see, and that's very encouraging. These are this year's freshmen, this year that just finished, year, freshmen, sophomore, et cetera, um, who are enrolled for next year. So less than 1% off compared to spring 2019 registrations 
uh, which we, again, see as a very encouraging sign for uh, coming into the next year. Next slide, please. This integrated work of the System Enrollment Council is helping us navigate the current context as colleagues and for the benefit, really, of the full university. And with the intensity of the moment, uh, we're also really looking at the long game. The System Enrollment Council provides a means for combining our strengths. As Melissa shared, we've started the work on system recruitment marketing and relaying the message of five strong campuses, one strong state. With that, we're looking to recruiting the class of fall 2021, while each campus works to solidify the current incoming class and bring back our currently enrolled students. Thank you for your interest in this work. At this time, I'd like to introduce our colleagues and fellow System Enrollment Council members. John L. Hoffman is Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs at our Crookston campus, and Fernando Delgado, Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at our Duluth campus. Both are on Zoom and available to participate in our discussion in case any of your questions are specific to either campus. Uh, we welcome the dialogue at this time. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Ratliff Crane, Vice Provost McMaster, and uh, Inter Vice Chancellor Burt. I was told that we had uh, the other two people on here somewhere, so I'm glad you introduced them because I haven't seen them, but I assume they're there. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for questions, and I see one hand is raised. That is of Regent Shu. Regent Shu, would you like to go ahead and ask a question or give a brief comment? We've got about 20 minutes for this. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, presenters. And thank you to the backup team that they brought along. Um, thank you for the presentation. It, it's very informational, although um, I did notice, uh, me, maybe I missed it, but I did notice there were some things missing that would be helpful to us in this discussion. Um, first of all, uh, the one thing I was looking for was yield rates, and I'm not sure if that was that was actually in there and how we're doing compared to, to history. Um, but I have to note that, you know, I've, I've heard from a number of students who have multiple schools that they've committed to and in fact paid, paid the deposit uh, to. So uh, the numbers um, actually, you know, may not be quite correct, but, you know, I noticed, you know, Crookston's down 44, Rochester's up 58, which is great. Morris down 91. Um, which is alarming. Duluth down 171. Twin Cities only down 69, and I think that's great. I uh, would like to see a breakdown of colleges um, that um, would still have space uh, today. And um, the, uh, the chart that showed the students by um, uh, the uh, upperclassmen and registrations, it would be nice to see that by campus. Um, so a, a little, uh, at least one level down. Um, regarding uh, the uh, survey that we all received last night that was done by the students, I think uh, we need to start uh, taking a look at, looking at that. It seems they have, I think they had uh, significantly more data points than our internal survey, which only had 86. So I think uh, we should, we need to look at that to kind of see um, what's going on with uh, students, especially the uh, students that have already been on campus for the last uh, last year. Uh, let's see. Lastly, uh, the long game, which was mentioned, is we must be full. We must not have gaps in our student body. So whatever we're doing. Uh, in terms of waitlist management uh, for the for the freshmen and transfer type people, uh, I think we need to look closer at that. I, I was expecting us to basically admit until uh, we hadn't uh, actually over over admit people, so that uh, if people drop out um, based on what our plans are for the fall, which we'll be discussing later, uh, we'll still have enough students. But the long game is we must be full. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. I'm not so sure there was a question there. A lot of great, great comments. Uh, I well, don't there know were a lot of, anybody. Mr. Chair, there were, there were some questions in there. Okay, well, I was just going to say, 
Is there somebody that wants to uh, get to some of those questions? I don't really particularly remember what they were. Um, Regent Shu, would you, would you uh, I mean, if, if there's at least one question you want to direct to somebody, could you, could you state that question? I don't well, think we would. Specifically, the Mr. Chair, thank you. The the yield rates. Um, how are the yield rates looking uh, this year compared to previous years? Okay. Okay. Well, I think uh, Vice Provost McMaster can probably give us a little idea on what he thinks the summer melt and yield and things may be. Uh, it's probably inconclusive at this time, but do you want to give it a shot, Vice Provost? Surely, uh, uh, Chair Anderson and and Regent Shu. In terms of the overall yield rates, and I'm, I'm speaking on the Twin Cities campus now, not for the entire system, but for the Twin Cities campus rates, our yield rates are, are, are much higher um, because we went way into the wait list. Um, we basically uh, admitted nearly 2,000 students off the wait list this year, uh, and, and that's helped us get the numbers up. So in, in that case, and uh, you'd, you'd see a significant change. Now, those yield rates, of course, would be geographically dependent on Minnesota, reciprocity, national and international. So one yield rate is not all that meaningful, but we can get you a table of yield rates. In fact, I think after the last meeting, uh, we produced that table of yield rates for one of the regions. It might have been Region Rosha. Um, so we can do that. Um, in terms of melt, I'll just pick up on melt because you want the class to be full uh, in the fall. We do too. Uh, and as we've thought about the number of admits and confirms, we have tried to overbook the flight. Uh, on the Twin Cities campus, for instance, our goal is 6,000 students uh, on the 10th day, hopefully a few more. And what we're, what we're seeing now uh, is or what we're planning for now is it is up to a 10% melt. Now, 10% melt would be the highest in history, but we're trying to be extremely cautious here given um, the fiscal situations of a lot of families. So with the 10% melt, we, we've already had a 2% melt, which is very standard. During May and early June, students withdraw their applications. So between now and, and on the Twin Cities campus, between now and the 10th day, uh, we have built in up to an 8% melt where we could still hit the class, the targets of the class. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we just shoot. A yeah, quick follow up. Um, I, I, I'm not following you on the melt because it looks like all your numbers are kind of below. Well, actually, I don't know what numbers we're actually comparing to because the numbers you're giving us are really uh, comparable for um, people who have accepted their admissions, correct? So uh, it, would, it would be nice to know, I mean, 10%, that's a significant number, and I'm glad, I'm glad you're building that, but the other campuses might be struggling uh, to have that 10% buffer uh, or whatever it is, 8 or 10% buffer. So it'd be nice to know kind of what we're looking at there um, as well. Thank and then, you. And, he, and, and then the last question. Matthew's the nodding his head. I think he agrees with you. I think he agrees with you. Um, Regent Simonson, do you want to go next? Or did I miss something there, Regent Shu? Well, I was, I was looking for an answer on how the colleges, uh, how we're doing by college, how many of them are full, and which ones have space. Vice Provost McMaster, do you have an idea on the top of your head on that? Um, Regent Anderson and, and um, uh, Chair Anderson and Regent Shu, I just happen to have some data on that, surprisingly. So <laughs> if you go across the, the seven colleges, um, they're all they're they're all overbooked in terms of the number, except CFANS, and we talk about CFANS a lot. CFANS is at ninety six percent capacity. All of the other colleges are at one hundred percent or over one hundred percent. So, for instance, the College of Education this year, uh, Education Human Development, is at one hundred and fifteen percent capacity. They overbooked. That's fine. We'll we'll take care of those students. So basically, all the other colleges have met their their targets, and we're still we still have 39 um, students who have uh, have um, uh, confirms waiting to come in, and some of those might go into CFANS, but CFANS is likely to be just a, a little short of 100 percent. 
Mr. Chair. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I some reason my internet cut out for a minute, so I may not have heard that. Where are we at here? Well, I just have a follow last follow up question, which is, um, you know, sometimes uh, the word capacity is used, and sometimes the word target is used, and we all know that target and capacity are not the same thing. So, would like a little more clarity on that, but we can follow up um, after the meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm going to go through my speakers list here, and, and I'm going to extend the uh, time we have till 11:25. But that just took 10 minutes of it, and so we do have one more item. This is a non, this is a non uh, action item. So Regent Simonson, followed by Regent Kenyanya, Regent Powell, Regent Mayron. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Anderson, and thank you, presenters. Uh, I'm uh, I represent the first district, as some of you may know, and actually I live in the southwest corner of uh, Minnesota. And so, um, and so as far as numbers go, may not be as significant as some other areas of the state, but I'm very interested in reaching out. We have here in Worthington, for example, we have over 50% English second language in our grade school and it's growing. And, and so I'm looking, I'd like to look at a plan, if you will, from the university that reaches out that's going to be something future, not next year, but reaching out to these students more. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as far as diverse the population relationships, uh, or use extension more further, if we could do that to reach diversity. More, we talk about financial aid, uh, but in a broad sense, could we look at financial aid more for this diverse population? Uh, we recently started a scholarship uh, in the district for first generation immigrants. But again, bottom line is I'd really like to look at a program with the university and our district here uh, to increase diversity and equity. It's a growing situation as, as we all know, and especially at the times we're at right now. And I think it'd be a very positive thing for the university. And one question then too, uh, what's our relationship with community colleges? Uh, uh, and does that help our university? That's what I Vice Provost McMaster, do you want to try that answer? Certainly, and I, th I think my colleagues have some uh, some contributions to make here as well. Uh, our our Office of Admissions has uh, a very tight relationship with the community college uh, system in the state. We have direct pipelines to some of the colleges where there are feeders from certain programs at, let's say, Normandale to or or um, uh, Anoka to our 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 programs at the university. In other cases, it's simply our counselors are in touch with their counselors. Um, the, the proof of the pudding here is that 35% of our transfer students come from the community colleges in Minnesota. So we have a very good relationship and I think that's across the state, but I think uh, my colleagues might wanna comment on their, their campuses. Uh, you know, with, with all due respect, with all due respect, we're going to move on because, you know, our third item deals with uh, school in the fall, which is a time related item. So we need to keep moving on this one. So Regent Kenyana, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Really happy that this uh, is a regular topic now um, and something we're very mindful of. I I'm happy to have seen that change over time, over the years. Um, I want to look at slide number six, um, six in the presentation, 39 in the docket. Um, and this is talking about the top destination for non-enrolled and admitted freshmen. I think this is something we talked about at the previous meeting. And I know I've spoken with uh, Associate Provost McMaster and, and whatnot. Um, and, and really what it's showing us is that the top destination for non-enrolling admitted students for every campus except the Twin Cities campus is another U of M campus, right? With the Twin Cities being the first one and Duluth the second one um, for most of these other ones. And um, I, I think this is inherently a good thing, actually, you know, that our students are either going to go to one U of M campus or another. I mean, I think that's really great. Um, and for most of the campuses, it's it's either 25% to, to about a third of the non-enrolling students going elsewhere. Um, I just want to bring up something we talked about last time and in, in how the, the impact of this is going to be magnified 
this year when we know the numbers are already down. And uh, to quote you, um, you said you went way into the wait list, right? And, and what this page is showing is that way into the wait list are admitted students at Crookston, admitted students at Duluth, admitted students at Morris, and admitted students at Rochester, right? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm again asking what, I mean, with that awareness, um, how are we thinking about that? Um, uh, knowing that, that going deep into that wait list is, is um, intensifying or magnifying enrollment issues at the other campuses because a year from now we will be, or whenever we're back here saying numbers were down and budget issues have been amplified. And, and again, you know, at the, at the local level, if, if you're, like I said, if you're, if you're working in the Carlson school and admissions, your job is to go get the students, you know, I'm not asking those people to be thinking systematically, but certainly the board level and senior administration, that is a concern of ours. So I just want you to talk a bit to that, um, especially in this year um, with the low numbers and, and the fact that with uncertainty, people might want to stay closer to home, which uh, might mean the metro area. I would say Vice Provost McMaster, do you have an answer to that? I don't have an answer. I have some thoughts. Um, yeah. Certainly, as we looked at the confirmed patterns over the spring, where in March, late March, and even early April, the Twin Cities was trending 9% down, 10% down, uh, we, we thought it prudent, in fact, an imperative to get to the wait list quickly so we could land our class of 6,000 students. Um, we, we admitted, as I said, 1,964 students from the wait list. I'd have to get back to you on how many of those confirmed. In fact, we, we probably don't know yet because we don't have all the final data yet. Um, uh, we're, we're still accepting confirms. Uh, we pushed out 5,000 names from the wait list that were shared. Now, some of those students, of course, were still considering the Twin Cities at the same time they were considering one or, or multiple campuses. Um, Regent Kenyanya, I think, I think we're going to have to do a detailed analysis at the end of this in terms of what happened with that wait list. So let's say a student in May was shared with Duluth and Morris that they wanted it. How many confirmed in the Twin Cities? How many confirmed at Duluth? How many confirmed at Morris? So I don't have clear answers for you on the specificity of what happened with, with the decisions. I will say this, uh, with some certainty, uh, given that a year ago, the, the Twin Cities went 100 students into the wait list uh, because we were uh, looking quite high at, at that point, given we went 1,864 this year, there unlike or very likely was an impact also on the system campuses in terms of the students on the wait list and, and where they were going. But I, th I think we're gonna have to step back and see because this was in some ways an experiment this year, pushing out that wait list in terms of those numbers, how students behaved. Uh, so it's kind of a nebulous answer because I haven't been able to, to do the kind of analysis I want to do yet. Thank you, Vice Provost. Thank you, uh, Regent Kenyana. Regent Powell for your comments. And please unmute. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. I'll, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, first, uh, for a couple of comments. First one, uh, I, uh, I want to comment on uh, Melissa Burke's presentation. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank all the presenters for a very good update. And with regard to Melissa Burke's marketing presentation, uh, I really appreciate uh, the work that uh, that team is doing. I, the, the fact that you're now uh, doing some fairly detailed marketing research, uh, and I absolutely agree with you that we need to understand you know, these people we're trying to reach better and we, and we need to sharpen the position of each of these campuses. So I appreciate the work that you're doing there. I think the, the bottom line for me is that this is a highly targeted marketing opportunity and we should be spending our resources on highly targeted vehicles. I think we're still spending money on mass market, you know, broadcast TV. I don't think that's a good spend. I would shift all of that money into highly targeted marketing and probably spend more because that's really one of the few ways we have uh, to create more demand. So I appreciate the work that you're doing there and really urge you to focus resources on targeted marketing vehicles. The, the second point I wanted to make is um, pleased that the enrollment picture is strengthening. You know, when the dust settles here, um, 
uh, Vice Pro Provost McMaster, I think we need to compare how we've done to our other Big Ten colleagues, maybe this year and on a rolling basis. My impression is that year in and year out, they're able to grow their freshman class one or two percent, maybe more. We would be in the bottom third on that ranking. And I, I think that this is a really important metric. Uh, why are we not growing as fast as they are? Maybe my data is out of date or I'm wrong. But from the last time we looked at this, uh, you know, I think we're at the lower end. And it, it, it's, a, it's something that we should look at and understand why. And then finally, last question. Um, you mentioned three variables that are affecting supply going forward. I'm reading a lot, and I think others are reading a lot about, you know, what was a challenging environment for small four years has really become extremely challenging. A lot of speculation that, you know, we're going to see uh, many closures. And I'm just wondering if you have any observations on that. Uh, does that shrinking supply in any way? I mean, I'm sure it's a, a positive for us, but is it a measurable positive or is it so dispersed that it's not even on our radar screen? So the last one is a question. Provost, Vice Provost. Vice Provost McMaster, you look like you wanted to comment on the second part about the freshman enrollment and then also maybe on the uh, small four-year. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Regent Powell, I didn't quite follow your, la your last point, so I'll, I'll ask for just a repeat of that, but I just wanted to go back quickly to your, your point on the size of the freshman class. Ten years ago, the size of the freshman class was probably 5,500, 5,400. Last fall, the size of the freshman class was 6,300. Uh, our target has really grown in, from about 5,500 in terms of the, the targets that are established each year up to 6,600. 6, so indeed, the, the Twin Cities has been growing their freshman class in large part to reach the enrollment plan target of 33,000 students on the campus. So. Uh, I, I think there is a, a positive story there. And I wonder if you could just refresh your, your question on the on the third part, which I didn't quite follow. I think, Vice uh, Master, I think the, the crux of it was the, the uh, what we're hearing is that the smaller four-year schools, whether private or public, are going to have harder and harder times existing. Okay. Will that help enrollment on the Twin Cities campus overall if that does happen? I think the simple answer there is yes. Uh, campuses, B Big Ten flagship campuses uh, are going to do much better in this enrollment environment because of the resources we have than smaller institutions. I, there's no question about it. And, and one of the things we can never forget is that we represent both types of those campuses. So we have to really be engaged in how we're creating the best opportunities for students at both the small four years and the large Big Ten universities. And that's that's part of the puzzle we put together. So thank you for the answer. And I think that answers it for Regent Powell. Uh, Regent Mayron, please unmute. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to uh, commend the administration and the presenters for taking our comments to heart last from last year. It was a year ago when you came in and reported uh, and how the direction is really palpably changed from what was happening previously and how pleased I am with uh, the progress that you are making on this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Regent Mayron. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Uh, Vice Provost McMaster, would you go back to the early slides surrounding the net migration of students out of Minnesota? Um. Sure, I, someone else is going to have to do that because I, <laughs> I, I don't control ask. I'm not in charge of that either. Yeah. So as they're setting that up, uh, the, the I think the number was that the state um, were losing 9,000 students uh, a year to go to institutions uh, neighboring the state of Minnesota and we're bringing in maybe 3,000. You know, I don't think that slide does... Um, uh, a great service because it does not reflect the fact that um, we're a heavy transfer school. So from years two through five, my guess would be, and I'm interested in your data points around all this, is that we're, we're recapturing a lot of the students. Uh, and at the time of graduation, with no offense to our neighboring states, they're not gonna be making a destination out of North Dakota or South Dakota or Nebraska or Iowa or Western Wisconsin. 
and that at the end of the day, the state um, will have the benefit of uh, students, even if they're educated out of state, coming back to the state. So this is maybe more of a state of Minnesota issue than it is University of Minnesota, but you're a pretty smart guy, Vice Provost. What would you say uh, that we, at the end of the, at the end of a, um, the, of this um, uh, four year period, how many of those students actually come back to Minnesota of the 6,000 net we're losing? Um, Chair Anderson yep. and, and Regent Peace, and I, actually my wife tells me I'm not very smart, but I appreciate your comment. <laughs> Uh, so I, um, I, I, I can't answer that really. We'd, 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 we'd have to go look at the data. What's the best estimate? 25% might return. I, I, I think most of the students are really completing the degrees where they go. We have some anecdotal information from Madison that a certain percent of Minnesotans that go to UW-Madison in the first year, and it actually works in both directions. Uh, changed their mind. They 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 made yeah. a mistake, and they should have stayed at the U of M, and they come back. Um, but in terms of looking at the whole spatial picture here, I'd have a hard time without looking at the data, which we can get to see how many students return and finish their degree at a university. Excuse me, at a Minnesota institution. Mr. Chair, Vice Provost, the 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 bigger question is how many come back and live in Minnesota, uh, and maybe you don't have that data, but uh, I, I think that data, that's the data that's missing when you present a slide like this, of, which is a disturbing slide about the net out migration of Minnesota students. To, well, to that point, I agree with you. I think there are, there's a much higher percentage that actually return upon completion of their degree into the state because of a very healthy economy in the Twin Cities in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Good discussion. Good discussion. Uh, we're going to go to student representative King and, and uh, student rep King. Are you on the beautiful Morris campus today? Uh, no, I am actually in my house. I bought a green screen because I needed it for meetings. <laughs> go ahead and ask your question, sir. Your comment. No, thank you, chair. Um, and, and thank you presenters. Um, my question was, have we looked at a tuition reduction to help um, with making sure that we get our Hit our target or make sure that we are able to fill up our seats on the campuses? What was the first part of that? You kind of cut out, at least on me. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, have we looked at a tuition reduction to help with um, filling up the seats in the on all the campuses? <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, I don't think we really have totally. I'm not the guy to answer that. I, I, uh, I don't know. If if we have, um, you know, the, the, my guess is the answer is no, because we, the budget is the budget. Uh, it's not a question really for Vice Provost McMaster because he's not the finance guy, but he's shaking his head. Um, President Gable, are you there? Do you want to speak to tuition costs of the various campus or tuition, tuition um, rates and how they're set for various campuses? Or would Vice or... Uh, um, Chief Operating Officer Burnett want, uh, want to tackle that one. Uh, Regent Anderson, um, I believe that Senior Vice President Burnett will be addressing this in the finance proposal, so I would su just suggest we, um, uh, if that's okay with Student Rep King, we defer to the finance discussion. You okay with that, sir? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any Anything else? Uh, no, that is it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, we're going to get to uh, Regent McMillan with Regent Svigum and Student Rep Batten uh, in the hall. So, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, three comments here. I'm not sure any of them has a, I'm asking for an answer, but observations. And if I'm wrong, I want to get corrected. But First of all, I applaud and have been for the better part of a decade um, looking for more system-wide enrollment cooperation and, and strategies and planning. And I see that, you know, it's happening and it's been happening. I think Vice Provost McMaster said 2017. So we start to see this kind of work and, and it's good stuff. 
Um, and I counter and I, I follow that up with the observation and it's not meant to be negative, but I think it's just a reality. I think the impacts on actual yield at Morris, Cruxton and Duluth of the Twin Cities campus going deep um, into its wait list are what they are. And I doubt, and I don't know this, but I doubt the yield outcomes at places like Duluth will, you know, be as rosy as the uh, share my app. Um, data that we just looked at suggests my guess is that their yield actually suffers as Twin Cities goes deeper into the, the wait list. Or, but that is what it is. I just think we have to as a board and have to as a senior administration be thinking about system-wide enrollment implications. And uh, Region Kenyan, you got into this and somebody else. I don't need to belabor the point, but I think uh, the unintended actual consequences on yield at our system campuses other than Rochester apparently you know maybe in that negative in terms of this but uh, that doesn't mean we stop we keep working and we try to figure out what we do and then there's the really perverse complication of pricing that uh, Duluth is actually more expensive than the Twin Cities and uh, I think um, that you know I've the flagships typically are the most expensive campus on, in any system, and uh, we've got uh, a historical anomaly that we priced that campus north of it. Morris is, I think, pretty close, and Crookston's cheaper. Rochester, I think, is a little bit more, too. So anyway, a lot of, lot of things at play here. I guess, reiterating, I, I'm glad we're at a system-wide level for the discussion, but I wonder in this year as the prioritization of the Twin Cities enrollment at 6,100, which I've, or 6,000, which I've been harping on too, you know, what it really means at the end of the day for our most price sensitive and uh, most competitive uh, regional comprehensive universities in the system. I, I, it feels like it may be a net negative, but I'm hoping not. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Regent. I you know I have, the, I have those same feelings, Regent McMillan. <laughs> Um, but I always look at it too, from the student perspective, if a student says, well, I will go to ABC college if I can't get into UMTC, and then the opportunity comes up for them to get into UMTC, whether because it went farther in wait list or whatever, that student is getting his wish. And so it's a really tough dynamic. It's a really tough dynamic because that may hinder ABC college that they're not going to get that student in that revenue. So but the student's getting his wish eventually. So anyway, it's a, it's a tough dynamic. Regis Swigum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, uh, I echo the, uh, the words and the support of uh, Regent McMillan for the, uh, the system of the University of Minnesota. Uh, seeing the work of the system enrollment council actually warms my heart. Uh, I, yeah. I think we have to look at ourselves as a system uh, and whatever is good for uh, helps uh, the Twin Cities campus helps Crookston and whatever helps Duluth helps Morris. I, I'm a firm believer of that, that we have to have the system. In fact, maybe we even have to expand our thinking a little larger and think of it as public education, uh, higher education within the uh, state and, and work with men's state uh, closer as we, uh, we share students and campuses because over the years, folks, over the years, and I come from rural Minnesota, as some of you do, uh, over the years, I've had this feeling, decades, that we have exported from rural Minnesota our best product uh, to the uh, metropolitan area, our best product being our kids. And I think we've exported them to the metropolitan area. Maybe I need to look at a bigger picture and say we're exporting, as Bob started out this presentation, exporting our kids from best product of Minnesota, not just rural Minnesota, but of Minnesota to the other, uh, other, other states. I, I need a bigger view, I think. So, so Bob, my question of you is, is, is this, uh, as we look at exporting those students, you said uh, two to one, I think you said, as you started your presentation, give, give me just uh, from your perspective or maybe perspective of others in the enrollment council, the one and two problems or barriers or concerns we have of keeping those kids here in Minnesota. Give me the one or two problems that, that you have, the number one and number two. Let's roll up master. I do want my colleagues to chime in on this as well, but I would say pricing and financial aid. 
if we could amp up the amount of financial aid we have for all of our students, we, we could then undermine the out-migration because we're going to be fiscally more competitive. Okay, if you're uh, following, a follow-up to that, Bob, if I could, a follow-up. They might be within the dollars we have right now, unless we get more dollars from the legislature or wherever, they might be mutually exclusive of each other. Are they not? Because as we increase the promised scholarship dollar, we have to increase tuition to pay for that. Uh, my understanding is that our tuition costs are for all students are about 7% higher than they should be if we didn't have some students getting the promised scholarship. So are, is that within the realm of what we're dealing with, our, you know, our circle, our sphere? That's mutually exclusive. Well, um, Regent Swigum, I, I think there's another piece to this. I, I, I'm not really promoting increasing the promised scholarship. I'm promoting private philanthropy and the kinds of scholarships like the Benson Scholarship and the Larson Scholarship and all the other private money that really has changed the game in terms of the support we can provide students. So I think that's the place where we need to push hard. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great Bob, discussion. Going to Regents Our circle, I, can, I buy that. Okay. Thank you. We'll get uh, student rep Batten uh, to her comment or question, and then we will move on to the next item. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, presenters. Um, as we have been talking about the, the state as a net exporter of high school graduates, um, my primary question is how do we see COVID um, impacting that? It seems to me that in migration and out migration, may likely be lower uh, this fall, but um, I'm curious to see how that's trending with uh, your enrollment projections. Vice Provost McMaster, do you have a, a sense of, I guess it would be NR, NR students and, and what uh, are we up or down with them? Representative Batten and, and Chair Anderson, um, that's exactly correct. Uh, if you look at the geographical increases and decreases in the freshman class on the Twin Cities, uh, we're, we're up 1% with um, Minnesota residents uh, due to the terrific work of our admissions office. Again, I, 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 I echo Jeff's uh, comments there. All of our admissions offices just did Herculean work this year in bringing in the class. Up 1% with Minnesota, up 6% with reciprocity. So again, nearby wanting to stay nearby, down about 15% with NR&R &R, and down about 24% with international. Now international has a whole different set of, of challenges this year because of embassies being closed and accessibility to visas. And so the, the, we're gonna have to work hard on that. But I think your, your point is correct. And I, maybe my colleagues see the same patterns on, on their campuses. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Provost McMaster. Uh, I just want to say, colleagues and all you presenters, this has been a great, we like to say robust, but this has been a really robust discussion. And, and you can see we're all very, very interested in this. We have different ideas of how we should market each campus. I, I believe the, the inter-campus marketing, you know, together is going to work out good, too. Um, I am going to say we are going to take about a five, six-minute break. Regent Croson or Provost Grossen. Thank you. I just wanted to chime in um, on a little clarification around the question around out-migration. So while, um, while Vice Provost McMaster discussed the um, cost differentials about different universities, if you look at that graph about net price, uh, we're actually quite competitive. So I'm not sure that uh, simply changing the price is going to significantly move the out migration in migration. I think that the efforts of this council around marketing are really important. I think that thinking about um, what it is that students are looking for when they go out of state, a better understanding of that, coming to Regent Powell's discussion about uh, targeted marketing and, and targeted market studies, I think that's really the direction we need to pursue in order to uh, retain more of our students in state. Thank you. So. We're going to take a break. We're going to start back at 11.45. That's seven minutes. 
Uh, I do know that finance, so we're 15 minutes behind schedule. Finance starts at two o'clock. So if we have to, we can go a little bit over what we have scheduled because we have a very, very important deal on what are our, what are we thinking about with our campus for this fall? So take five minutes if you want to stretch your legs. Um, actually, it's seven minutes. We'll see you at 1145 right here. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. We can hear you, Tom. Okay, I just don't, nothing's on, so I just, I can't see anything, so. I assume we're on, though. I'm not able to access my video, so I don't know if you're doing that at your end or not. I No, I'm on the same. So, Mr. Lindemann or Ms. Flatten, would you uh, let us know when everything is ready? Yep, you can go ahead, Mr. Chair, and call us back to order. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right. We'll call the meeting back to order for our third item of business. Uh, let me find my page here. Okay, our third item of business today, and... Um, I'm just looking on the screen to see if we've got people sitting. We do have quite a few people here. So um, will be our COVID-19 pandemic, the framework for delivering academic mission in fall 2020. Again, this is a review item. Uh, this is the committees we've had working to find out if, uh, you know, what our academic mission will be starting in the fall of 2020. Very interesting to a lot of people. And it's a review of the framework for delivering the academic mission in the fall 2020 semester. Uh, President Gable and President and Provost Croson will lead us in the discussion. Discussion. President Gable, are you ready to begin? I am. Thank you, Chair Anderson, uh, Vice Chair Davenport, members of the committee. I'll tee this up, and then Provost Croson will take over. Uh, since we met last in May, amidst this challenging time. The university has taken some important steps to address the questions posed to our academic mission as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a very important and obvious cornerstone of that work has been the fall scenarios planning work. Um, and today you'll hear their recommendation for fall 2020. This work has been in an advisory format that committee is representative of academics, operations, the science in public health and has sought consultation from a wide group, including students, faculty and staff, which Provost Croson will update you regarding. As Provost Croson will go into more detail in just a few moments, I'll just highlight that our recommended plan calls for the university to be available for in-person education and on-campus experiences this fall. I'll note that we've never closed. We've simply moved our on-campus activities to a distributed learning format and so the fall proposal simply brings a combination of those activities back to some portion of face-to-face. -face. The exact start and end dates also will vary as a reflection of the recommendations of this work. The key and the spine in all of these uh, recommendations that you're about to hear about is flexibility. Flexibility to meet the needs of our faculty, staff, and students. Flexibility so that we can maintain the highest quality amidst their different needs and flexibility so that we may adapt as conditions may change according to the overall public health of our community or individual health concerns or other challenges that we may not be able to anticipate right now. Ultimately, we believe that we are as safe as any place to be able to protect the health and safety of our students, faculty, and staff. It is our number one priority and we are prepared with extensive planning to be able to do so. Much planning remains to be done, but we're here to report the appropriate progress given what we know and what we know we are able to anticipate going forward. And with all of this, we're extremely excited to welcome our new and returning students back to our campuses this fall. In addition, and in the interim, we also intend to augment our summer offerings with a limited set of classes in July, which would span the final weeks of the summer session. This July semester, as we've been calling it, will offer our students the opportunity to take classes face-to-face -face that may not fit with their regular academic schedule or to accelerate or catch up on coursework that is highly beneficial in a face-to-face -face format or to offset their course load in the fall 
so that we are able to both meet their needs and reduce the density in the classes that have a higher face-to-face -face component with the limited number of classrooms that we're going to be able to make available as Provost Croson will detail. But at this time, Mr. Chair, I'll defer uh, to the rest of the team to continue the presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, rest of the team, I assume that is Vice Provost, uh, or Provost Croson. It is, thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, President Gable. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, please go to the next slide. In April, President Gable created a scenarios advisory team to plan for the delivery of the academic mission for this fall in the context of COVID-19. The team brought together public health experts, both from our campus and from the Minnesota Department of Health, academic leaders and operational representatives from across the system. Those specific team members are listed in your docket. As the team did its work, we relied heavily on the principles approved by the Board of Regents as applied in this context, also reiterated in the docket. The work focused on four key spheres of academic life, classrooms, study spaces, and libraries, labs, and studios, housing, dining, recreation centers, student unions, and events, and outreach and engagement. Our work was informed by public health data and guidance from the CDC, the MDH, the ACHA, and others, as well as planning underway at peer institutions. We solicited feedback from our campus communities, first with an open survey in mid-May, and we consulted with university faculty, staff, and students' governance, as well as academic and administrative leaders. We met with MSA, PSA, and COGS on June 3rd, SSCC, the Student Senate on June 5th, SCEP on June 4th and 5th, uh, we held, which held a vote on June 8th, and the Faculty Senate on June 9th. We also met with staff governance groups to discuss our work. In this presentation, I seek to describe a broad set of conditions under which we were proposed to resume some in-person residential instructions in the fall in a manner consistent with public health guidance, making our campus as safe as anywhere else that our students, staff, and faculty might be. Please go to the next slide. As President Gable mentioned, the backbone of this recommendation is flexibility. First, we learned through our discussions and consultations that individuals need flexibility. Instructors, staff, and students may be differentially vulnerable during this time, either based on their or their family's health status, their identity, access to technology, disability status, or their ability to come in camp to campus in person for any reason. Everyone should have alternative modality options as public health guidance allows. As an aside, I know this has been a source of some confusion. Our proposal is not that all instruction will occur in person. It is that some instruction will occur in person. Second, individuals need flexibility over time in case their status changes. This includes succession planning for instructors and staff, building in accommodations for students who fall sick or must quarantine, and reviewing and revising our policies regarding student absences and bereavement. Third, the institution needs flexibility over time, as we know the conditions and public health guidance will likely change, either requiring us to return to more restricted operations or allowing us more flexibility. And finally, the system needs flexibility. Differences between the system campuses will require variations in design and implementation of these recommendations. The infrastructure varies on each campus, as do local public health conditions. And as those conditions change, individual system campuses may need to adjust their mission delivery. Please go to the next slide. We are thus recommending the resumption of in-person instruction and residence halls, dining facilities, in a manner consistent with public health guidance. While this recommendation comes to, before you for, to, for review today and approval in July, President Gable and I hope to earn your endorsement at this meeting so that we can communicate with incoming and continuing students 
faculty and staff prior to the final action in July. This recommendation includes, uh, in, in consistency with public health guidance, includes dimensions such as adjusting capacity levels for classroom occupancy, residence halls, and dining facilities, as well as other in-person experiences. It will also involve instruction being delivered via multiple modalities, fully distanced, hybrid, and fully in-person. While we cannot commit to offering every course in every modality, we commit to ensuring that students who cannot participate in in-person instruction will nonetheless be able to advance their education. For example, for incoming students who might not arrive on campus in the fall, like international students who are struggling with visas or others with underlying health conditions, each college has committed to offering a fully distanced incoming curriculum, which includes not only courses, but also community building experiences. In consultation with MDH, we seek to avoid students traveling repeatedly between campus and their family homes, which would often happen during the fall semester. In addition, public health experts are predicting a surge in late fall, which may also coincide with flu season. We thus further recommend that system-wide, all campus in-person undergraduate and graduate instruction stop by Thanksgiving break or sooner if public health guidance dictates. This can be accomplished by academic calendar adjustments, a planned pivot to distance education at Thanksgiving, or a combination of both. Finally, we recommend a set of actions to increase public health and safety on campus. This includes self-monitoring for symptoms. It includes a stepped up cleaning uh, regimen in various spaces. It includes testing when clinically indicated isolation for those with the virus, contact tracing, and quarantine for those who have been exposed. We have sufficient testing capability and have identified and will further dedicate isolation space, both in the residence halls and in off-campus hotels for this purpose. Our on-campus team is prepared to offer contact tracing for our entire university population. A testing committee co-chaired by Dr. Tolar and including Dr. Osterholm, as well as three representatives of the, uh, of the Minnesota Department of Health, has been formed to advise us on more global testing or screening as the science progresses in those areas. We will rely on our colleagues at the medical school and the genomic center to help us uh, deliver whatever their recommendation a separate task force is examining HVAC systems in each classroom, considering, considering barriers and cleaning protocols. A public health campaign encouraging healthy behaviors is being planned, and a community code of conduct is being explored for those who return to campus to agree to. Please go to the next slide. In President Gable's May 14th system-wide message to students, staff, and faculty, she solicited feedback from the campus community. Although the overall response rate was relatively small, the primary themes from this feedback were that 32% of respondents supported flexible instruction, which is what we're suggesting, 17% support, supported an online or distant scenario only, and only three responses, 2% supported only in-person education. In addition, we received 13 unsolicited emails, which are summarized in your docket material. Additional input was received through consultation with university faculty, staff, and students' governance, academic, and administrative leaders. As mentioned previously, I met with MSA, COGS, and PSA leadership on June 3rd. I met with SSCC on June 5th. I learned for the first time last night of a student-run survey, and we look forward to incorporating the insights gained there into our planning as well. Next slide, please. President Gable and I believe that this framework will allow us to move forward with flexibility as the situation demands. Some of the issues that will still need to be determined include the following. Exactly which courses will be offered in which modality? 
Some instructors will prefer to teach online and we're committed to supporting them through the existing and additional resources we have procured over the summer. Classroom capacity constraints may limit how many courses we can offer in person and when. As described in the plan, we intend to offer extended hours when classes are scheduled and explore additional spaces that could be repurposed for classes and considering offering additional courses on Saturdays if needed. We will also encourage and empower faculty to consider creative mechanisms to achieve physical distancing. A high flex model is one example where a rotating portion of the class attends in person each day while others attend online. Faculty may prefer to have a class assemble in person with appropriate physical distancing to enable group work while they lecture remotely. Or perhaps all students will watch the lecture online and then half attend one day and half another to engage in discussion. We're also examining upgrading technology in our classrooms to facilitate these creative modalities. Regardless of the modality chosen, faculty will be prepared to accommodate students who need to be absent from class, have a succession plan for themselves, and pivot to fully distanced if public health conditions demand. A second uh, issue to be decided are changes to the academic calendar. So SCEP and Faculty Senate voted this week to permit changes to the academic calendar for the Twin Cities and Rochester for the fall. I intend to recommend a slightly earlier start for Twin Cities and Rochester with a transition to distance education at Thanksgiving. Other campuses are considering their own calendar changes as well. Labs and other experiential learning components of classes may be front loaded in order to ensure that they be completed in person in case of an outbreak or an early pivot. And as President Gable mentioned, in response to the governor's newest executive order, permitting in-person instruction of class size of 25, we intend to offer an in-person July semester option on the Twin Cities campus. We're selecting a small number of experiential and lab courses that can be offered in an accelerated format in order to reduce the density in these critical courses in the fall. Finally, I want to return to the backbone of flexibility. Implementation decisions will be made and adjusted as public health guidance changes. And of course, if we need to pivot again, we will be prepared to do so. Next slide, please. This continues to be a challenging time and there is much uncertainty. This framework is designed to balance our needs for sufficient direction to continue planning for the fall while retaining flexibility to pivot as public health guidance allows. As mentioned at the start, we understand this recommendation comes before you today for review and approval in July. But President Gable and I hope to earn your endorsement today. This will allow the university to communicate with incoming and continuing students and parents, staff and faculty making clear that our planning is subject to final approval by the board. I look forward to your discussion. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair Anderson and members of the board. This concludes my remarks. Thank you. So we've got a, a good look at how we want to present classes to the student enrollment uh, for the fall of 2020. And I think we, uh, it's up for review today and we can have whatever discussion we would like on that to ask questions or suggest improvements or whatever we wanna do. I'm gonna look and see if anybody has their hand up. Oh, they do, okay. <laughs> so uh, I've got student representative Batten, then I'm gonna have uh, Regent Shu, Regent McMillan, and then we'll take it from there. So student representative Batten, if you'd like to start us off, thank you. Thank you, Chair Anderson, uh, Provost Croson. Um, so one question that's coming up among the student representatives is, are we considering how tuition might be charged or would it be charged at the same rate or different rate for programs that go entirely online? Um, so that's one question. A follow-up to that that I have, I know that's been expressed by PSG students is um, access to the student health 
benefit plan for programs that are all online and how that affects eligibility. Um, is, so those are a couple of questions that I'll bring out right now. I have other musings, but they're more personal than <laughs> reflective of the student representatives. So, so the, you know, student health plan question is a great plan. plan. The tuition, I could see that coming. You know, I mean, that's going to come in, into the deal. So I think uh, President Gable is probably the person most attuned to answer these unless she has uh, agents on the board or, or uh, agents and uh, representatives in the uh, audience here to answer those. So President Gable, tuition and student health plan, if you could, could answer those, please. I'm going uh, to, with regard to tuition, um, uh, remind that the details will be covered in the budget, but uh, the expectation is that tuition would be the way it is already um, approved to have been so flat from last year, no differential, um, depending on modality or surcharge, depending on modality. Um, with regard to the specifics of student services, our, um, we have modified some of our student services already, as you know, to reflect the fact that none of the students are, or very few of the students are on campus right now. Some are still living on campus, but no one's taking classes on campus. And it would be our expectation that we leverage the blend that we've um, had to come to somewhat abruptly and have now smoothed out in order to continue to deliver all student services into the fall. Okay, thank you. Uh, student Representative Batten, does that answer your questions for now? Uh, yes, it answers the pressing ones. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got Regent Shu next in queue, followed by Regent McMillan and Regent Beeson in the hole. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Provost uh, Croson. Um, appreciate the update. Um, my first question is, um, the Faculty Senate was asked to approve an August 31st start date, but I'm not sure I heard that uh, in your presentation. Um, so I'll start, I'll just say that uh, I'm, I'm all for opening if it's safe. And the question is if it's safe. And um, I'll note that uh, Dr. Osterholm was mentioned and I happened to catch him on uh, MSNBC last night, late last night in the 11th hour show with, uh, uh, I think, Brian Williams. And he mentioned that uh, uh, the indoor, having people indoors uh, in large numbers, or I, I don't exactly know what he said, but he basically said it's unsafe or something to that extent. So I, I'd like to find out exactly what he was talking about and how it uh, specifically works into our plan, as he is one of the people that uh, is apparently reviewing our plan. Um, regarding um, the early start date, if in fact it's before uh, the day after Labor Day, and I was, I'll, I should say that I'm, I'm for starting it on time, because um, as you know, as most of you know, students um, who live in off-campus housing their leases don't start until September 1st. And students uh, who are currently occupying those properties uh, have to move out on August 15th. And then that gives the landlord two weeks to refurbish or clean the um, um, apartments um, and houses so that uh, they can be occupied on September 1st. So I think, you know, having a bunch of homeless students um, trying to figure out where, they're, where to put their stuff um, while they're also trying to start classes, I think it's not really worth the one week. Um, if, in fact, it's August 1st or 31st, it's only a one week um, uh, change in schedule. And I think, uh, you know, we can certainly do better and make up uh, that one week uh, later on in the, in the term. Um, there's also the issue of the graduate school and their uh, graduate students and uh, contracts with the other, I don't know how many thousand instructors um, that I've, I've heard prohibits moving the start date up even beyond August 31st. Um, and uh, this, there was a, quite a discussion on the faculty in the faculty senate the other day. So um, if you haven't um, listened to that, I think um, I think you should. Um, uh, in terms of the rest of my colleagues, I should say. Um, there's also questions about welcome week and the dorms uh, on an earlier start and how that would work. Um, are we going to reduce the capacity of the dorms 
Um, how are we going to do the dining, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of, I have a long list of questions um, um, in terms of how, how things would operate uh, regardless of start date. Um, and then the student conduct code issue, I think is important because if we, if we mandate masks and students don't want to wear masks, then, you know, at what point do we decide that uh, that's not in the community's best interest and um, have some type of sanctions for that? I don't know how other schools are handling that. Um, regarding, uh, and then regarding the extra costs, et cetera, for cleaning and uh, all the other things you mentioned, I think um, I'd like to know a little bit more about that um, and who pays for the testing. Who's going to be tested and who pays for the testing? Last month, I asked that question to um, uh, Dean Tolar, and he said that uh, testing would only occur if you uh, were symptomatic and your health care insurance would pay for that. And I'm not sure how students are covered these days, um, you know, if they're not on their parents' plan, and even if they are on their parents' plan, they could have a significant deductible plan, which would then create um, additional costs for students uh, returning to campus and was wondering how, how we plan to deal with that. And the tuition question has already been asked, so I don't have to ask the question, but uh, I, I'm interested in the answer to that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Shu. You bring up, bring up some, uh, some great questions. I think I'm gonna turn it over to, I think Provost Croson is probably the correct person to ask of these, uh, the two that I really got out of there, I think, are safety. And I think his question about where people live, where students live, we can control the dormitories, but what about the private people and, and dates? Uh, do you have answers to those questions? So President Gable was going to chime in first. Oh, I'm sorry. President Gable, we're going to have you answer the questions. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Chair Anderson. All right, I'll just buzz through those questions. So um, on the news last night, Dr. <clears throat> Osterholm was talking about thing, uh, indoor events that don't have social distancing, like concerts. Our plan um, has people inside, but maintaining social distance. He has reviewed the plan personally, as have other members of our incredibly talented and competent public health team who are affiliated with SIDRAP, as has MDH, and they all have approved our plan. With regard to off-campus housing, the advantage to starting early is that the earlier we start, the more degrees of freedom we have in order to be flexible. We've already started consulting with the um, Association of Landlords on trying to find ways for them to be flexible. We have space that we could use for students who can't work with their landlord on that. Um, but the um, ability to move or for our students to be homeless is obviously something that we would not want. And we've already started working um, as a community to partner to support our students because the sooner we bring them back, the more instruction we know we can complete before there might be a change in circumstances as a result of how the disease may progress during the fall. And flexibility is the spine of the entire effort. Dorms have been inspected on every campus by representatives of MDH and by our own public health experts. We are modifying according to their recommendations. This guidance comes from the CDC and MDH, and we are in full compliance within the plan as we are with dining. Student conduct codes would be altered to reflect whatever the science is at the time. The science right now is not mandating masks. This is an area of great dispute, even on our own campus and within our own community. So we are at strong recommendation at the moment because that is what our external scientists are recommending to us, as well as our internal scientists. Faculty, of course, can set whatever standard they want within their own classroom. That is part of their academic freedom. If they want students in their class to wear the mask, that is a different conversation, just like they might want students to not have their phones on their desk or otherwise behave in certain ways while they're in the class. In terms of costs for testing, that is covered by insurance, and we are also part of the governor's plan. So we're prepared to treat our students as part of the community testing program that our medical school and Mayo are doing in partnership with the governor. Testing is available. And there are many ways in which students can get tests for free if for whatever reason they fall in one of the rare circumstances where traditional insurance would not cover it. There is not one thing that has been asked about that we have not anticipated, planned for, vetted against the science, consulted against, and then included in the plan. Thank you. 
Thank you for your uh, concise answers there. Uh, appreciate it. I, I'm sure all my colleagues do. Um, just so you know, I've got a list here and we're going to go through it. Regent McMillan, Regent Beeson, Regent Kenyana, Regent Powell, and Regent Rocha are on my list. So we will, uh, I, I should ask Regent Shute, Regent Shute, is that, does that cover to some extent what you asked? And, and would you uh, be willing to listen to what the other regions have or do you want to ask something else? I have another follow-up question. Um, I appreciate the answers and I just want to clarify whether or not uh, there would be, in terms of all these modalities we're talking about, for students who uh, either cannot come back to campus or choose not to come back to campus, I just want to make sure that they are able to um, enroll and attend these classes. It's not Provost clear. Provost you, you look like you're nodding your head. Do you have a quick answer to that? Yes, so as I, as I mentioned in the presentation, not every class will be offered in every modality, but there will be a robust, a significant and robust offering of distance education. If for no other reason that we're not gonna have enough physical classrooms to achieve social distancing and offer all our courses in person. And so there will be a, a large number of classes that are fully distanced. Uh, and again, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have specific uh, distanced options set aside for incoming students where we know exactly what they're uh, what their first year was likely to be. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu, for your questions. We'll move on to Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and uh, thank you, President Gable, for running down a, quite a list of, uh, of safety-related questions. I've got another one. Regent Shu touched on masks, but I've got a little deeper, a little deeper question around the masks and the safety that uh, that they generate. And we've got a fair amount of input from students, both some that you got and some that we were uh, given a, a report today on a Twin Cities focused piece that's good. I think, uh, you know, we, we think first about students, but staff and faculty matter tremendously here as well, every bit as much. And how do we think about a mask requirement versus a mask recommendation when we think about student faculty staff safety and uh, and then I think there's a there's a bit of a, a veneer on top of that around cities that have mask requirements like Minneapolis versus Morris or Duluth where there probably isn't a mask requirement and uh, and then in places like Duluth you've got a much more indoor focused campus so I'm just curious if if a mask mandate or a requirement is something you've given thought to and how do we go about keeping perhaps more vulnerable parts of our employee faculty base um, you know, safe if, uh, if masks are optional or merely recommended. And I'm not, by, say, by asking that, I'm not saying I'm in favor right now of a mandate, but it seems to me that's gonna be the safest approach. And I don't know to what degree you've you've gone beyond recommendation into considering requirement. Okay, Regent, uh, Provost Croson, do you want to answer Regent McMillan's questions? President Gable, what do you think? I'm happy to take it. Uh, I'll start and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, yeah, my, my problem is I don't know who's the expert on each subject. So that, that's <laughs> fine to, to tag team the way you're doing to get us. I think that what really matters is we get the best answer. Well, I, I don't know if I'm gonna offer the best answer, but um, I will start by saying that the mask discussion has been obviously a very big part of the discussion, just like it is in society in general right now um, with, um, as one might expect, all of the range of representative voices around the issue being reflected in our campus community, just like it is every place else. What we have been doing is relying on the science with the understanding that the science is evolving. So where things are right now is that the mask is um, particularly helpful if you are closer than six feet. If you are able to maintain social distance, the current thinking is that the mask is strongly encouraged, but that the safety comes primarily from the social distance. That may change, and there are varying scientific opinions about what I'm describing, but that is the fat part of the bell curve on the science, and that is what we've been basing all of our plans on at the moment. If the science evolves to either become stricter or looser, we will evolve too, and we've built the plan accordingly. Thank you. Regent McMillan, does that answer your question? 
I'm uh, glad to hear it's a robust discussion. I, I assumed it was, and uh, I guess I would assume there may need to be some geographic uh, differences too in how we go about applying mask requirements given, given. I guess the one thing I didn't hear an answer to, do we follow Minneapolis's lead on, on what I believe is a mask mandate right now, but maybe I'm not familiar with what they've got in place. Uh, that mandate does not apply to us. It would certainly apply to our students if they went off campus. Okay, thank you. Good point. Um, thank you. We're gonna get to, to Regent Beeson, but before that, I just want, just so you know, I do have uh, hands raised. I picked them up from Student Rep King, Student Rep Fatten, Regent Sigam, Regent Her. so I'm aware that you people also wanna chime in here. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do support the, the, um, uh, the plan. The conversation about the start date, uh, I was reminded by Senior Vice President Burnett, you know, the preponderance of our students live not on campus or off campus, but near campus. And uh, they do have this, uh, their landlords have the issue of the leases um, not expiring until the 15th of August and they need time to turn those spaces around. I think in the ideal world, we would start August 17th and that's what a lot of private colleges seem to be doing so that they can finish their entire semester in person online by Thanksgiving. But I just don't think we've got that flexibility. Um, the other comment I was going to make is that, you know, we're we're embarking on a um, we're embarking on a plan, and the we're you know there's going to there will be students who are going to get sick, and some students are going to get very ill, and we live in a fishbowl, and we have to be prepared psychologically for the likelihood of having some sort of outbreak, and we have to stay calm, and we have to follow the science, we have to stay with the plan. It's not going to be perfect. We it's it's just a riskier situation than we've we've encountered before, and uh, we're we're going into it with our eyes open. Uh, but um, I think it's the right thing to do, and we've got experts supporting us, people that understand this and with the right rules, and adjusting as we go along. I think we can make this work. Thank you, Regent Bees, and those are your comments. With no questions. No questions. Thank you. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Provost Croson for the presentation. Um, I wanna, first of all, thank you um, for pointing out that student survey that I think most of us got yesterday. Obviously haven't had time to digest it, but really good work by those students. Um, I think we can trust it because we know where they, they were educated. Um, but anyway, still trying to process some of that info, and I, and I was able to skim it. Um, I, I guess I, I have a comment and two questions. Um, just want to echo the, the the comment about the the housing um, and just making sure we are accommodating that week um, where there's a gap in leases. And um, I was happy to hear the president say that possibly space on campus could be facilitated for that, depending on on how that goes. Um, Representative Batten brought up the student health plan um, and and thinking broader in terms of student service fee, um, board policy mandates that online credits do not count towards the the credit threshold for for a class being counted as, as a um, for someone having to pay the fee. I'm, I'm not saying that correctly, but I hope that's getting across. Um, just wondering if, if that's been considered in, in, you know, if if a large amount of students will be doing online instead, um, how will those fees come through, especially considering those are the same units that are currently depleted um, due to the, the recent um, refund? Um, and, and, you know, maybe there's not an answer for that, or but um, just wanted to put that one out there. And then my other question was... Um, Provost Croson, you said that most classes will be, um, uh, there will be an online availability, but it certainly won't be for all. Um, I just wanted to, to, to suggest and, and hope that we're thinking about, specifically, I want to say seniors, maybe juniors. Um, we know how rigid certain uh, disciplines can be and that you got to get in this class in order to get in that one. And if you miss that one, you're pushed back a semester, um, right? So in terms of um, 
waivers or, or just alternative accommodations. Um, we certainly don't want to see a lot of students push back a semester or possibly even further because we know how the sequential nature of uh, some programs operate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see Regent or Provost Croson uh, nodding her head and, and wants a chance to answer. So if you would, go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Kenyanya. So on the housing issue, which seems to come up, we've done a survey of the major landlords. Uh, about half of the off-campus student beds have um, start dates for the leases that are actually before September 1st. About half of them have start dates that are at or slightly after September 1st. And so those are the landlords that we are uh, interacting with to see if, given that they have two weeks planned for cleaning, could they perhaps get their cleaning done earlier and start the uh, lease on, for example, August 29th, Saturday, as opposed to September 1st. Um, so we're optimistic that there'll be, uh, there'll be some flexibility there. And as President Gable said, uh, we will have alternative housing arrangements if, if necessary. Um, so the second question you asked was about um, exactly which classes are available. And I fully agree with you that we need to think strategically about prioritizing which classes, for example, need to be offered in person and which classes need to be offered at a distance in order to ensure that students who are facing different challenges will be able to continue their education and won't be delayed. Uh, and that is indeed a, a conversation that all of the uh, all the deans and all the associate deans are having with each one of their directors of their various programs. Uh, one you may have been alluding to, although you didn't name, is engineering, which has quite a lockstep type of curriculum. And I know that the, the dean of engineering and the college of engineering has been very um, careful and conscious about ensuring that the courses that students need to progress uh, will be available in multiple modalities, as have all of the colleges. Thank you. Regent Kenyanya, does that answer your questions? It does. Thank you, Provost Preston. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Regent Polk. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just quickly, um, first of all, I, I really appreciate the huge amount of work that's been done by the four teams, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm supportive of the plan. I think landing on you know, flexibility and agility and choice is exactly right. Uh, with a very high focus on safety. And so I just, I really appreciate the immense amount of work that's been done. Um, couple of, couple of uh, a, a, a suggestion, first of all, I mean, we have a very comprehensive, you're proposing a very comprehensive safety program. We touched on this a bit in audit. You might want to, you know, think about and consider, you know, what you're going to do to monitor compliance with that safety program. Uh, because, you know, we just have to make sure, that, you know, uh, uh, Rachel, no slip between cup and lip. And, and, and so that, that'll, that'll merit some thought. Um, the second question uh, uh, or, or the quite other question I have is maybe President Gable, you can answer this one. Um, have all of our Big Ten, Big Ten peers declared uh, and anything noteworthy in, in some of the approaches that we're hearing? And then finally, I just want to clarify, we're talking about moving the term up one week to August 22nd, or is it two weeks to the 15th and then ending on the 27th, which is Thanksgiving? I just wanna make sure I'm clear on, you know, is there a one week slide or two week? I just wanna make sure I understand the, the term. Uh, That's it. I see you nodding your head, but I also- I'll, see let, I'll, let, I'll let President Gable go first. Mm -hmm. President Gable, your prerogative. Chair Anderson, uh, Regent Powell, the, just the first part of your question, the um, proposed calendar, what we've come to um, with, as Regent Shu noted earlier, the affirmative vote of the faculty is a proposed one week early start. Um, we would then go online at Thanksgiving. Um, every, not everything would be finished at Thanksgiving. Um, there would still be the exam week. That extra week buys us degrees of freedom uh, rather than a full on acceleration. It actually gives us a spread and just adds to the flexibility component of the plan. Um, across the Big Ten and across our peers, um, large research universities, small privates, as you might imagine, there is a very wide notable spread. Um, but most of the Big Ten that has chimed in has chimed in very similarly to where we are now. There are slight tweaks. Not every university has access to the healthcare that we do. That has affected some of the decisions, doesn't have 
um, a medical school that is working directly with the governor on the testing that has affected some of their decisions, but a, but a, a flexible multimodality um, reopening for fall is, is pretty consistent across our peers. Thank you. Regent Croson, what our Provost Croson, I keep wanting to put you on the board. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't you want the demotion. So I guess, I guess, uh, pres President, Pre President Gable, Gable got it, got it right. I'll just add that the Big Ten provosts have been meeting every week. And at our last week's meeting, we all went around and talked about our plans. Um, ours are quite similar, as you might imagine. There's, uh, as President Gable, um, pointed out there's some that are uh, a little more worried about the testing and contact tracing part of the plan because they don't feel that they have the internal capacity to deliver it. Thankfully, uh, the investments in our medical school have paid off and we do. Thank you, uh, Provost. Uh, next up will be Regent Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. I just, I, I wanted to you know, put, put in my perspective that um, you know, this is this is a very difficult process. I really appreciate the work that's being done on it. There is no perfect answer. We know that. There, you know, even before this enterprise, there's risk of having uh, large groups of people together in, in, in any setting. And obviously, it's been um, you know, changed quite dramatically over these last several months. But you know, I, I would urge that all of the sort of unaccounted costs of of our, our current status um, as a community. And as a nation, um, and as a world for that matter, um, are, are mounting and significant. And, and the, the sooner we're able to move back into a uh, some state state of normal uh, interaction with each other, I think uh, uh, far the better. And so, um, along with that, I think the necessity is the uh, um, uh, the impetus for for invention. And, and I think that you know, to the extent that we are able to, to devise a way that people can have access to remote learning, um, as, you know, while uh, having the option of being in class, um, you know, that's just a, that's just a wonderful development under any circumstance. And, you know, and I'm not even talking about sort of the online uh, education that's, that's prevalent in some locations, but, but really just in being able to offer that to our students and, and to take advantage of technology that some of us expected <laughs> Many years ago, would would be far more developed than it is now. So, um, that my 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 take would be getting back in the classroom as soon as possible. You know, and, and being mindful of, of the risks that that are present at that moment, um, with the opportunity for the technology to allow us to pivot. So, I know I'm not saying anything novel, but that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rosha. Thank you. Um, Student Representative King, and I will say I also have Regent Mayron and Regent Davenport now in the queue also in that order at the end. Uh, Student Rep King. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, presenters. Um, since the survey had came out yesterday and looking at it, 74% of the students would um, were be interested in having the U um, provide masks. Is there any looking into that? to providing masks for the students or no? Great question. Uh, Provost Pro Colson, there you go. President Gable. Yes, so providing, providing masks for students is indeed part of the plan as are masks for faculty and staff. And uh, I know our procurement folks are, are busy working on that. Does that answer your question, Student Rep King, or is there more? Yes, thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. Student Representative Batten. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, presenters. Um, so a couple questions that I will preface with. Um, I was listening to a webinar last week and Reshma Saujani, who is the CEO and founder of Girls Who Code, said, um, she said remote education is digital segregation. And that, that hit me really hard <laughs> as a former teacher. Um, and, and so the questions that this brings up for me one is in terms of internet access. Is there any advocacy happening on the part of university leadership to say work with the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission to standardize broadband and high-speed internet as a utility rather than an individual opt-in to, to help with that? Um, so that's one, that's one question and then a sort of shifting gears question is um, 
you know, obviously we're looking at how to maximize and leverage campus spaces for learning. Has there been any discussion or strategic partnerships with other organizations across the state, say Hennepin County Library or the Great River Regional Library with, you know, satellite locations that have meeting and workspaces where say students could be in small groups close to home and getting tele-education, not strictly remote education. So I'll put those out there. Those are great questions. I happen to be in outstate Minnesota right now. I've lost connectivity twice today that I know of, uh, but I do know that our administration had yeoman's like work to get people connected in different places when we shut down in March. I will let them answer the question, but I, I really think that they really worked hard on trying to get that. But go ahead and answer the question, if you will, Provost Grossman. President Gable. Anderson. <laughs> Um, so uh, some of these questions, um, student rep Batten, predate the pandemic and are um, sort of excavated and exposed by um, virtue of the circumstances of the pandemic. We have been a part of conversations both with state and federal government around broadband access. We also work with private industry partners like Land Lakes. You may have read about some of the work that they're doing um, on the establishment of depots, which is more of an issue in rural um, and greater Minnesota and surrounding states where many of our students come from um, than in the metropolitan areas. Um, we work with um, a variety of partners around standing up and sharing broadband access. Um, but we also have done um, work to make sure that people have access to um, laptops or other devices so that they can engage. So that's part of the, it's a combination social challenge. So we've been able to um, outfit many of our students with the technology, handheld technology that they would need in order to remain engaged. Um, we use our partnerships with the libraries. We use our own extension offices um, for hubs. And then we're working with other um, resources like Land Lakes and the depots that they're establishing. And then the last thing is we have also kept campus open for, for the students for which none of those are the best option, the safest option in whatever way we would define that term, have been able to stay on campus and then remain um, with high access to the broadband that we provide, the services we provide and the other um, attributes of being on campus. Thank you. S student Rep Batten, does that answer the question? It does. If I may bring up, um, so yep. one more question, I guess, we've talked about the infrastructure and we've talked about space. Um, what is happening behind the scenes on a from a pedagogical standpoint to uh, really leverage the innovation of our great school of education and others to, you know, look at how to make remote learning meaningful and impactful and not just a recorded lecture? Um, because obviously the the two are very different and the learning that happens in physical space versus online space or synchronous versus asynchronous are very different. So, you know, what does that support and challenge to professors and instructional staff look like? Guess I'll take that one. So, uh, so indeed, we've provided some significant uh, resources and training to our faculty to in over the summer in anticipation of um, of the need to be able to be multimodal this fall. And and by faculty there, I'm, I'm thinking about instructors and teaching assistants and a whole wide range of people who support courses. So the Center for Educational Innovation has. Uh, a very robust program. Our academic technologists have continued uh, to be active, even though they've done I mean, they phenomenal yeoman's work for the spring transition, but have continued to work with faculty. Um, we have a, a now a singular site where a faculty member can go and ask for, describe what they need, and ask for whether they want one-on-one -on -one coaching, or uh, they want to watch a webinar on how to do something, oh. or they want to you know, engage in a, in a Zoom-type training with a small group of people. So there's a wide array of resources. Um, we are also quite conscious uh, that this, you know, this decision is gonna put a burden on the faculty who many of whom need to re-prep a course uh, that maybe they haven't taught in a given modality before. 
Um, and so we're committed to providing them resources uh, and support as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Cross. And I hope that answers the question. Uh, I think I got cut off a little there, but uh, we'll keep moving. I've got Regent Svegan, Regent Her, Regent Myron, and Regent Davenport. And we've got 20 minutes till a hard stop. So, uh, Regent Svegan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, colleagues, I'm a firm believer that balance is important in life. You've you got to have some balance. So I, I did some checking last last night, it was, with the Chronicle of Higher Education, just to see where we were with this plan, with Dr. Croson and Dr. Gable's plan. And by the way, I strongly support it uh, to the two of you. And I found out last night in checking real quickly that uh, two-thirds of the colleges and universities in this country right now have already said that they're planning for in-person uh, fall semester. Uh, another 9% are looking at a hybrid model. Another 9% on top of that are, are, are looking at a range of scenarios. And there's still like 7 8% that haven't decided yet what they're going to do. What I'm saying is that gets us to over 90% of the colleges and universities are planning for some hybrid or at least in-person on campus. That puts us in the balance. Uh, and, and I just think that that's comforting uh, to know that that we are not out of the, we're not extreme, we're in the norm. Uh, this is a good thing to do, a good plan to follow with flexibility, following the, uh, the recommendations of our healthcare experts. Uh, I just think that we're, we're moving in the right direction. And yes, there is a risk. There is no doubt there's a risk to life, but there is a risk. But I think the risk is greater if we do not have in-person classes. So I strongly support you, Dr. Croson, and, and the plan of uh, President Gables. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Svegum. Regent Her. You may be on mute, Regent Her. I can't hear you. There may be. There you go. You know, maybe they can work fixing it with you. Let's go to Regent Mayron while we're waiting. Regent Mayron. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, I, I just had a, a question and, uh, and a comment. Um, I, I think the, the point that was just made about um, by Provost Croson about what is uh, what support that the university is offering to faculty uh, to be able to convert programs as needed to different modalities and they're used to uh, using is critical. Uh, and one question I had is uh, it's one thing to offer it. It's another to have some oversight um, system wide to ensure not only quality and consistency. So my question is, is there, oversight, is there any oversight function uh, that is contemplated as part of the plan? And the second question has to do with, in the survey that was provided to us last evening by the students, uh, there were a number of comments and concerns raised about transportation in particular on the Twin City campus about um, how are they going to do distancing when the transportation use of the connector, the bus system puts them very up close and personal uh, with each other and how is the university going to address the transportation issue at least uh, as to the Twin City campus, but it could be an issue as well system-wide, but given most of the respondents were from the Twin Cities, that clearly was a focus. So. If those two questions could be addressed, thank you. Provost Carlson. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Mayron. So, um, so two different questions. The first is about guaranteeing or, or monitoring the quality of instruction. Um, and we're intending to do that the same way we do that every semester, right? Through peer, um, you know, peer evaluation, through student evaluations. Um, I could imagine, as you might know, we've, uh, we've changed the student evaluation mechanism uh, last year in order to incorporate the fact that there was a change. Um, we had not looked at that 
again, but I could imagine a similar kind of adjusted evaluation mechanism. And although I'll, I'll have to talk to our appropriate individuals here, I'd love to see a, an earlier evaluation. We have an optional midterm student evaluation, but I could imagine that instituting something like that could be, uh, could be informative both for the faculty member and to enable a pivot if we needed to enable it. Um, on the transportation side, so my understanding is that, of course, we run a shuttle between the Twin Cities campus and the St. Paul campus, and that shuttle's operations will be adjusted based on CDC and MDH guidance, which involves, unsurprisingly, social distancing, extra cleaning, masking, this type of thing. We have much less control over public transportation that we don't operate, um, but I think, you know, working with the city, working with other uh, entities to identify what their plans are for enhancing safety and communicating that to students will be definitely in our, in our wheelhouse. If I could just follow up then, Sherry Anderson. Briefly. Yes, on the uh, evaluation, um, you, you, the evaluation you've described are, is basically after the fact. And even if it's midterm, it's somewhat after the fact. And I'm interested or would encourage us to look at what could we do to take a look at whatever the faculty member instructor is gonna be doing before it goes uh, into practice so that we can try and catch any inconsistencies or quality related issues. I think we would be better served on the transportation issue whether it's working with the MTC or whomever, I think that is absolutely as critical as working with the landlords, because if we can't move the students around, uh, then this in-person instruction is gonna fail. So I think that's critical as well. And with that, I, I will say, I support the plan that you all have uh, put forward and commend you on all of the work you have done in such a uh, collapse period of time. So thank you. Thank you. Regent Hurd, do we... Regent Hurd, do we have you online? Yes, I think I figured things out. All right, yes, I'm speaking in favor uh, and in support of the recommendation, but I just have um, three comments and they may, they, may, they may not even be questions. One is um, I do support system-wide efforts as much as possible. So I love the idea and I actually love the idea of the academic calendar being augmented or being switched and moving to not so much a temporary fix, but I would recommend considering it as a, as a permanent uh, fix going forward. Because my concern is that if students become used to something, when you take it away, they're going to be very upset with you. And the idea of having a whole December off is just wonderful, even for myself. Um, so... Uh, Second is that um, uh, I'm concerned also about setting expectations for online learning versus in person. And I know that we went to 100% um, uh, remote learning and that worked and didn't work. But I think as an institution, how do we balance it so that, uh, so, I, and I don't even know, you know, considering if someone just decides all their four years they're going to be taking all the courses so that they're remote and if that's okay, and how much of the percentage can we as an institution bear and what's our policy going forward, sometimes it's 50-50 or sometimes advanced courses are not at all um, available online. So, so that, the idea that yes, we are doing a lot of temporary fix to fill the holes, but long-term being very uh, strategic and setting um, as much expectations about what our out, what our ultimate goals are going to be. I think it would be helpful guidance um, for students as they plan their academic careers. Thank you. Terrific. I think I think those might be, some of those might be questions for the long term. Is that fair? Okay. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And I echo the appreciation for the rigorous planning, um, especially as we look at the flexibility and consultation with public health team. I'm hearing um, what sounds like unanimous support for the plan, plan for fall. So I'm wondering, um, I guess I would propose we consider taking action on it uh, at this meeting rather than waiting until July so that families, students, uh, faculty, and others can plan. 
and have this be a known rather than a lingering unknown. Okay, so it is a uh, review item today. However, there have been times we've done review action. I understand that. I think to do that, we're going to have to get a motion. Are you making a motion on the table, uh, making a motion to approve this plan as of today? Yes, I'm making that motion. Rather, okay. Mr. Chair, uh, before the motion is made, if you could just check with the other members to ensure there's no objection to bringing it forward for action, that would be the proper procedure. Okay, I will do that. We don't have a second yet, but we'll just ask about the, uh, is there any objection to bringing this forward for action today? I object. Okay, Regent Hsu. Um, I, I guess I'm going to need help with Robert's rules of orders here. There has not been a second, so we really can't discuss it. Um, there's been a first and an objection. I don't I know where to go. It. I would second order. the motion so as to get it on the table, and then we can have a discussion about whether to do it or not. So, so Regent Mayeron is uh, the asking Regent Shu or Re Regents for objection has nothing to do with Roberts, evidently. So, Regent Mayeron, you have seconded the motion. Is that what you're telling me? That's, that's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, so I now, just I just want to check in about the um, about the proper procedure here. I okay. believe that since there was an objection that we cannot move forward with having a second or moving oh. forward um, on taking action on this item today. I would just ask um, if Mr. Langworthy could just confirm that um, for me. Is that a function that it was not on the agenda for an action item then? Is that, is that the function That's of that? That's correct. Um, and uh, Mr. Langworthy just confirmed with me that uh, it is correct since there was an objection. And I'll just note the policy reference here in Board of Regents policy, Board Operations and Agenda Guidelines um, under meeting procedures. Um, it says any, um, for review items, any board member may request that an item listed for review become review action item if there is no objection from other members of the board. So since there was an objection, okay. this can't be brought forward for action today. Okay. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm just thinking. Yes. Who is, who is speaking? I, I am. Regent Shu. Okay. Oh, the Regent Shu. Go ahead, Regent Shu. Yeah, I would just say I, I I wouldn't even know what we're actually approving. It's not written down anywhere. I mean, we've just been talking about a bunch of stuff. There's no no dates even in the presentation. But I, I would say that I would support uh, moving forward if uh, if the dates don't ch if the current calendar does not change. There's there's so we do have we do have an endorsement for this policy, but not the actual action on it. I don't even know what is, the policy, I don't even know what the real policy is because it's not <laughs> not documented in a coherent fashion. Yeah, I, I mean I understand that. I mean uh, when when. You know, Rachel, uh, Provost Croson came on today. She asked us for a, an endorsement of this policy. Uh, we were giving an endorsement. It sounds like 12 to 0 without a, without a vote. Um, I, I think that's pretty fair. But they're also telling me by the rules of the board, if there's an objection, we can't even get it on the table as a motion because it was not an action item. Correct? Correct. Yeah. And you don't, you don't, you don't propose removing your objection to get that on the table. I, well, if, if someone wants to actually, um, I, I don't support the, I'm not one of the, uh, I, I said I supported starting uh, on time. That's, what, that's all I've said. And okay. I, I do support. Yeah. So the, the date was, I actually, I gave the date. Nobody, nobody else uh, verified that date really, really until. Right. Uh, doesn't well, sound like I, that I, agree even there, I agree with you that there is no resolution that has a date on here. Uh, we're endorsing the framework for delivering academic mission in fall 2020 as presented, I guess, what we're doing, which is a very flexible plan. But it, it appears that uh, we cannot 
approve the plan today. So, I mean, that's, that's how I'm taking it. And it's, uh, um, but I think we've given a, a, um, a really good idea to students and parents and faculty of what we intend to do at, at the proper time. I, I think that's a fair statement. Um, does anybody have anything else? I'm ready to call that, uh, that agenda item over and move on to the next one, unless somebody has anything they want to comment on that agenda item. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe Regent Rosha and Regent Kenyanya both had a hand raised. Regent Rosha. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When I, when I raised my hand, it was a, a little bit earlier in the discussion. I, the, you know, the two, the two questions that I had, one is what was the actual resolution? Um, because it, it seems like there's a flexibility here. And obviously every day we get closer to the start date, we will have more information to understand what, you know, we would want to be doing. And the second, secondly, to what extent is it advantageous to vote today? Because I understand we're going to get a, a clearer picture as the administration, you know, further develops um, uh, the, the specific plan. So uh, I think that's been covered, and 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 uh, I agree uh, with the intent of the motion. Um, I think that it was an accurate reflection that the board seems to be uh, comfortable with with this with this a flexible approach with a focus toward opening uh, timely, um, and uh, look forward to hearing about it at the next uh, meeting. Thank you. Terrific. And the second one who had their hand up was Regent. Uh, I Mr. Chair, here. I would I withdraw my my. Oh, Regent Ken you, you re Okay, thank you. So I guess I guess that that is going to. Uh, Regent uh, Anderson. End, I, yes. Regent Anderson. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you. Um, I agree with Regent Rosha that. Um, the intent is good. I think it, it does, this does signify that we're moving in a direction. I, but staff does need some more time to firm up these dates and uh, test out some conversations with, uh, with landlords and such. I would be open to a special meeting uh, before the July meeting if we, if they're really ready to go before then. I agree with Regent Davenport that earlier is better, but let's let the staff drive this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regent Davenport. Thanks for your uh, sentiments on this. Uh, I think the consensus is there and I appreciate that. Uh, we will move on to the consent report. Regent Croson, um, I'll ask you to provide a, a brief introduction of the items or, um, and then we're gonna need a motion to approve that. So your consent report items. Thank you, Chair Anderson, members of the board, the June consent report is before you. Proposed programs include a master's of marketing degree, two graduate professional certificates, also in the Carlson School, one in the medical industry, and one in supply chain management for medical and health sectors, an undergraduate minor in user experience, and an undergraduate minor in econometrics. Programmatic changes include a joint option for an MS degree in business analytics and finance, an integrated undergrad grad degree option with the bachelor's of science in, in business and the master's in human resources and industrial relations and two other integrated undergraduate and graduate student programs, one with two CFANS programs and one with CFANS and the College of Science and Engineering. There are also three programmatic discontinuation requests all in the Twin Cities campus. Finally, the consent agenda includes nine requests to grant tenure and faculty grants. Chair Anderson and members of the board, thank you for your consideration. That concludes my remarks. Is there a motion to uh, accept the, and approve the consent report? So moved. Is there second. a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and second. Any further discussion? Okay, I, uh, I gotta ask my parliamentarian again because we're on a video meeting. Do we have to have roll call vote? That's right. Um, I'm prepared to call the roll, Mr. Chair, if you're ready. Ms. Lawton, if you'd call the roll, please. Great. On the committee consent report, Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Regent Her. <coughs> <clears throat> we'll come back. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. 
Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Chair Anderson. Yes. Chair Anderson votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 yeses and zero noes. The consent report is then approved. Uh, that'll bring us to item number five, information items for discussion. Um, Provost Croson, any comments on these? We're, we're you know, we're, we're up against running late here, but uh, if you have any comments, we're happy to listen. Uh, very quickly, Chair Anderson, members of the board, the information items in your June docket is our regular report of faculty, student, and staff accomplishments. These remind us that the exceptional work our university community continues even in these circumstances. I will highlight the first item, a $35 million gift by the Minnesota Masonic Charities to the university to establish the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain, which will focus on the prevention and treatment of neurodevelopmental disorders in early childhood and adolescence. In addition, many student leaders on all campuses are recognized for their impact in communities, including volunteerism, creating programs for families affected by Alzheimer's, and working on student mental health issues. We're proud of our students' accomplishments as always, but especially at this pivotal time. And I wanna finally thank you all for your uh, robust discussion and deep engagement with uh, this, this committee's agenda. It's been extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Provost. Um, I'm just going to remind everybody we're going to adjourn here in a second, but you've got a finance meeting coming up in about 59 minutes. Um, no additional business for the committee. We now stand adjourned. Thank you.